attention, please. Would you stand with me? I'm going to call the meeting to order. And I'm going to ask Trustee Monk if he will lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that you can give us yet again to come back together uh, in person as a group. And we certainly hope that everyone who's had uh, troubling experiences with, with the past uh, year and a half uh, has, has found a way to, to make those adjustments. We pray for our school that you give us a little more wisdom than any of us really possess to, to make good decisions and in accordance with what you would have us do. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, David. Anyone have any public comments? If not, it is so delightful to see such a good turnout of folks at our meeting tonight. It looks like we're going to have fun. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we do have several things that we need to, uh, business we need to tend to. And one of the first ones is uh, Dr. Terry Easton. Uh, we're going to be uh, swearing him in here in just a moment, but I'm going to ask him, if he will, to introduce, he has several guests here. If we'll, will you stand up and introduce your guest? If they could, I think they're still standing outside. <laughs> okay, can they come in? Just... Helping remember First, <laughs> let me introduce my my wife. I want to thank my wife Donna Easton for her love and support through all of this endeavor. She's been a a rock. So thank you, sweetie. And then I want to introduce and say thank you to Mr. Ray Raymond thanking him for the opportunity to come down and spend his time and allow me to go through this process. So Raymond and the board, thank you for this opportunity. And I have uh, my longtime friend, Officer Logan here. He's the chief of police at Bullock ISD. So Officer Logan, thank you for being here. Uh, Ms. Spurlock, and her son, Brett Ben. I want to thank him for coming out and offering their support. I think all of you know Terry Spurlock. So thank you guys. And the best principal in the Coffin County, my boss, Amy McAfee, and her husband is here. So thank you, Ms. McAfee, for coming. Ms. Z, Ms. Jessica Tuckovich and her son, Jonathan. By the way, Jonathan's one of my students. And I want you to remember his name because he's one of the best students in Crandall. <laughs> and we would like for him to eventually probably be a student here at some point. So remember that name. Uh, who else? We? And Mr. Butler, Kenneth Butler, he's my colleague. He works there in the social studies department with me. And Miss Dark, those are my two teammates that works with me in teaching. And one of the guys that helped me develop my wing, Brad Rogers. <laughs> Brad and dad works here at the school, Jerry. That's 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 the little son, but he doesn't look little son. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Mr. Johnson is one of my assistant principals that used to be with me over the years. Guy Johnson, thank you for being here. And my Nephew, Darren Williams, standing there in the corner along with his girlfriend. Thank you, Darren. And Eric and Bubba, where are you? They're back. Okay, Eric and Bubba. Okay, here's here's Eric. I didn't see you, Eric. Thank you. <laughs> Eric, if you need anything in reference to any type of supplies, Eric and Bubba. Is <laughs> so thank you guys for being here. And uh, got one more gentleman. Kenneth Everett. Kenneth has, I've known Kenneth for a long time. Anybody that needs help with mathematics, Algebra 1, 
he's the man. <laughs> That's, that's that's the guy that get it done. He's been doing it for a long time. So if I miss someone, I apologize and we owe I owe you lunch or dinner. And because of me being here, I want to close and say thank you, thanks to Judge Wiley, her husband, Aaron and brother Joe, they are here. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to be here tonight. So again, thank you for having me. We want you, to, all of you that are here on his behalf, we want you to know that you're very welcome here at the college anytime. And, and I'm so proud that you're here tonight uh, to support Dr. Easton. Because I think that uh, he's, he's, got, he's kind of excited about this. And, and, and so we look forward to working with him in the future. And so uh, just thank all of you for coming tonight and in, in, in his support. Okay, at this time, uh, <clears throat> if you would, go out here, and this is Judge Randy Daniels. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Terry Eason, do solemnly swear or affirm, do solemnly swear or affirm, that I will faithfully execute, that I will faithfully execute the duties of the office of TBCC Board of Trustees District 9. The duties of TBC Board of Trustees District 9. Of the state of Texas, the state of Texas, and will do the best of my ability, and will do the best of my ability to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution, to preserve and protect and defend the Constitution, and laws of the United States, and laws of the United States, and of this state, and of this state. So help me God, and so help me God. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Thank you Judge. All right, we have one other item of business that we want to attend to right quick uh, before we go into the business session. And uh, it's, we're going to talk a little bit early about Mr. Homer Norvell. Uh, and I'm going to, the few things that I'm going to have to say about Homer, I'll say them at this time. And then Dr. Jerry will have some remarks. And then I want the board to have an opportunity to say whatever you'd like to say on Homer's behalf. You know, Homer was a good person. He was a teacher. He was a coach. He was a Christian. He was a great community leader. He was trustee of this college for 33 years. And most dedicated person, I think that you can find anywhere or you could find anywhere when it comes to concern of education for students. That was his first love. And that's really about what he lived for. Okay, uh, but he also loved TBCC. Uh, you just couldn't say anything about TBCC. He wouldn't respond. And uh, Homer sat right here by me for a number of years. And so I got to know Homer not only through this uh, uh, relationship on this board, but Homer and I, we go back about 50 years. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, 
But Homer had three very successful children, one daughter and two sons, and everybody loved Homer and all the hell. And so, Jerry, do you have something you'd like to say? I'd just like to say that it, it was a pleasure working with Homer for the years that I did. He was a role model for me. Um, he was always sitting there and he was always pleasant and positive and he always dressed really nice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no matter where we went, whatever. I remember going to New York City on a trip with Mr. Norville a few years back. And um, it was just always somebody that you always wanted to be around, somebody that um, you knew cared about the college and he was always here for us. And, you know, even when it was difficult for him to drive, he was coming down here watching basketball games. I'd meet him at the front of the gym and he'd bring him in and we'd sit together. Um, it was just uh, that very dedicated, very the, the type of person that you always want to be around. And I'm so grateful that I had the years that I had, the last five years as president of the college with Homer Norman. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna go around. Mike, uh, you have anything you'd like to, you didn't know? Okay, uh, Ron, do you have anything? I, whenever we heard that uh, Homer had passed away, I had told Darren, our son, who was a graduate of Hoffman, okay? And he said, Dad, he said he was one of the really good guys that he had the opportunity of taking instructions from during that period of time. And I thought to myself, what a compliment that a kiddo that grew up would have that kind of respect for Homer Nor Norville because he thought he was a true gentleman. David? <clears throat> I did not have the benefit of being close to Homer in his own community living over in Chandler, near Chandler, and Homer up in Coffin. Sometimes that seemed, seemed like we were the world's apart. But I think the first time that I sat at this board or came together with the group uh, 20 plus years ago, the thing I remember about Homer <coughs> Norville was a warm handshake and, and a wonderful, friendly smile. The last time that I had occasion to exchange greetings with Homer Norville, it's the same thing. So that's the way I remember him constantly. Well, I've got long memories of Homer. Uh, growing up, in, I grew up in Terrell, but my daddy's back clinic was in Kaufman. So when I was a little kid, I'm running around the clinic with Homer would come in. And Autry even worked for my dad one year when I was one of those little kids. Uh, so I, I remember those days. And, then, of course, Daddy was on this board for years, and he would tell me about going to pick it up Homer and then coming down here together. And, uh, and then, of course, Homer and Ray and I rode down here together almost every meeting. And uh, Homer was someone that I always knew was going to be consistent. And we generally agreed on everything, but if we didn't, there was never a problem. We could disagree, but uh, we didn't very much. Terry, I don't know how you're going to fill those shoes. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> but uh, we're glad you're here. Yes. Uh, but uh, I don't think you can do it. But I'm going to try to help you try. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. One of the best experiences I've had was having Homer on the board. He always had a warm heart. Uh, he's kind, spoke, did dress pretty well. <laughs> but it's all the same sometimes. But uh, he, he cared deeply about the college. But I got to know that he cared deeply about you know, what, uh, his church, his family, and the things he did around the Coffin community. He, he, he was a true steward and, and servant of this community. Homer was a good friend, loved his cows. <laughs> <laughs> so we had one thing in common. And I stopped and visited with him time or two at his house and he'd show me his cows. <laughs> and, but the main thing about Homer, he put the student first. That was his number one concern. Well, how's this going to affect the student? And he was a dear friend. Thank you all. I have a short biography here that I'm going to give you a copy of. <clears throat> <clears throat> Goes back a little bit more what we're seeing here
Look at this. No. Not with the DA. I'm in the wrong county. Okay, let's do photo walk out first. Okay. Let me read what it says on the plaque. This is a plaque in loving memory, Mr. Homer Norville. For 31 years of loyal and dedicated service as a Trinity Valley Community College Board of Trustees. And we want you to have this for the family. Okay. 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 <laughs> just a bit. Yeah, but no, we were coming for Terry, for Dr. Eason. Well, that's the more. That's the more. Yeah, and so we are just so appreciative for the college, and I thank all of you gentlemen that were trustees with him. I, you hit it so spot on. There's nothing to add. Yeah, Dad, you know the generation that he comes from. Education changed his lives, and it it was important to him. And he saw that change in his life and his family's life. And he wanted that same opportunity for all these students, not only obviously here in Henderson County, but all the counties you start. And you know, he is he's still working hard at some of the different school districts that uh, he wants um, Trinity Valley Community College in. So he always loved the school, but he was very strong on education. And I'll hear these great stories from people like you were telling me about, you know, your son and you hear something. And you go, wow, how many people's lives that you touch? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say that Dr. Eason is up to the challenge. <laughs> and uh, we look forward to seeing him do that and for the board collectively to keep making those great decisions that you make for this community. And no pressure, President. Thank you. No, <laughs> no, pressure. no, 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 no pressure. No pressure on you either. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Our lady is our district attorney over in Paulson County. And I suppose, <laughs> uh, I suppose, I, I, I've, I've heard Homer talk about it and, and, and brag on you about a lot of things, mm -hmm. but he, he was so happy that she ended up being district attorney in County. Well, wow. I think my mother and my dad, you know, always wanted more for their children. It, it was so, we, we take it for granted mm -hmm. how challenging it must have been for them. And Ray's very modest because he helped along the way during the years with all the different challenges. And him and my mother were great friends and worked together on the shelter. And that but you was, had no choice but it. Yeah, she had no choice but it. Yeah, yeah, but he knew how to raise that money and get it done. And then dad was in the background. And the board made the decision to make sure they had diversity when dad was here. And I think you picked well with Dr. Eason and keep up that spirit to me for me to just get involved. But yeah, we go back so many years. You know, it was why, really, was my third grade teacher. She was only, <laughs> she was only 18. I think she was a child of 18. And she did that. But yeah, we, we our families go back a long way. And her son, and we were classmates. We love you guys and we appreciate the warm, warm Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse so y'all can conduct this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would love to hear, you know, I, I participated in some of those last meetings on Zoom, but I think y'all got it right. <laughs> well, we have a lot of issues tonight that we need a lot of help on. Y'all have your own legal team, I know that. But y'all, anybody feel free to leave. We'll see you. Bye bye. All right. Excuse me. Of course. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right, we're down to business time, I guess. And so we'll move right into uh, item number four on the agenda, which is the president's report. I, board, I have a few things I'd like to, a lot of this you already know about because I've provided in my updates over the last few weeks, but 
I want to mention spring graduation was a really, really, really good one. We had a record 712 graduates. Um, I think the previous number of graduates that we'd had was like 640 or something like that. So it was a large number of graduates. Included in that, we had 215 dual credit graduates, which was also a record much more than we previously had. I think we ended up with um, almost 85 or 86, 81 from Terrell Independent School District, 57 from Athens, 34 from Palestine, 13 from Malakal, three from Frankston. I attended their graduation ceremony and we had two from Square Roster. I attended their graduation ceremony. So we had a great graduation. It was a rolling graduation, which means that we had them coming in. We didn't have a big audience, but we had them coming in one at a time. And I think they really liked that because they liked, enjoyed being up in front of the stage and being able to cheer on their, their graduates. And I think it was really good. I don't know if we'll do it that way again. It was a four hour graduation ceremony <laughs> and I stood up for four hours. And so did Dr. Parnell and so did Mike Emory. I'm not real sure we, we could do that again, but we'll, we're gonna see what we need to do next time. But it was really great graduation ceremony. I wanted to mention our enrollment that we have thus far. It's, it's still early for the fall. But we do have a um, uh, we have an increase in the summer graduation. We have a 9.19 percent increase in summer thus far. Uh, I think I've got this in front of you here. I think it's out there, so you'd have that. Uh, and then we still have summer two classes that will continue um, registering for classes through July the seventh. And so it's better. It's looking better. It's getting better. We feel optimistic. We feel much better. It's great to have a. It's been 14 months since we've been in this. Uh, in this facility, and it's really great to have you guys here and to be able to see you in person. Our fall 2021 graduation is also much better. Right now, we're at 7.21% increase. Um, enrollment in the fall classes continue through August the 18th. And then we have fall eight week two classes that will continue through October the 14th. Our contact hour funding is way up, uh, primarily because last summer we didn't, we weren't able to have contact hour funding for. Um, in-service training that we do at TDCJ, and we weren't able to have contact hour funding for our, our summer enrollment at TDCJ because we couldn't have it because of COVID. So uh, it looks better. Um, we're, we feel better about the fall. We feel better about the summer. And, uh, you know, it's not back to normal yet, but it's close. The um, Bachelor of Science degree in nursing, I, I mentioned that to you already a couple of times in some of the emails that I've sent out. We're very, very proud of that. Uh, that's, we started talking about that, I think, Dr. Reisinger, about three or four years ago. We started talking about that when we we're talking about moving in, renovating the hospital in, in Terrell. And it, it's, it came into fruition. It's, uh, the last two years, it's taken a lot of work and a lot of effort on a lot of people's part. But uh, Dr. Reed and her staff uh, have, have really done an excellent, excellent job in making that happen. You had to go through three different steps. You had to get it approved by the nursing uh, association, national association, you had to get it approved by the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, and then you had to get it approved by SAC CLC, and we did, and we're proud of it. Um, I can't say enough about that. I, right now, we have 25 students enrolled in that program. We have a maximum of 30 for the fall semester, so Helen keeps telling me it's not going to be a problem, so we'll, we'll, we've still got a while to get a way to go, but it looks very good. Jer uh, Jeremy McMullen, which some of you know, was here a few, few years ago at TBCC as a president at Grayson. He called me the other day thanking me for uh, uh, congratulating us on what we had done. And he asked me, who did it for? And I said, what do you mean? He said, didn't you contract that out to be done? And I said, no, we, we did it internally. And he said, I paid $50,000 to have it done at Grayson County Junior College. Mm -hmm. I haven't told Helen that yet, but I'm going to. <laughs> she, she's probably watching us on TV tonight. Um, she she did a, she did she did more than a great job. She did an excellent 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 job, and I feel very good about what we're doing there and where we're going with that. Uh, I just had to throw in that part about Jeremy calling me because I I couldn't get over it. I knew that I knew that we were saving a lot of money, but Jeremy said he had some, a consultant that did everything for him at Grayson. And, and he didn't. He, and we didn't do. We didn't do that at all. Uh, the board budget committee. I wanted to mention that we did have a meeting last Thursday. It was a good meeting. 
Um, we, we're going to talk a little bit tonight about some of the things that we talked about at that uh, board budget meeting. And we have another one scheduled for Thursday week. I believe that's July the 8th. And then we'll probably end up having another one in a, a week after that or you know, a few days after that. We'll end up probably having three or four budget uh, board budget meetings before we bring to you the, the budget in August, I'm sorry, in July. And then for you to approve in the mid-August meeting. Uh, we have um, our next scheduled board meeting is um, July the 26th. And I think, unless somebody has any questions for me, that's pretty much, other than some of the things I've provided in my updates, that's pretty much all I've got. Any questions for me? <laughs> Anyone have any questions for Gary, Dr. Gary? If not, we'll move into item number five, consider the minutes of the April 26th, 2021 board meeting. Do I hear a motion that we approve them as they were presented or do you have any additions or corrections? Jerry makes motion to accept them and Steve seconds that motion. Any further discussion? If not all in favor, say aye. All opposed, like sign, motion carries. Item number six, consider business financial and investment report for March and April, for March and April of 2021. I'm gonna turn, turn that over to David Hopkins. David? Well, that's small. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have a copy, let me, uh, first I'm back, really uh, as of April, the, as you might expect, the revenue is still down. However, based on what I've seen, uh, as of, I just looked it up, we're already over 12 million in tuition. Um, we're, you know, 1.4 million down below uh, this time last year, and corresponding decreases, of course, in housing and uh, food services and so forth. Uh, again, and I'll talk about this at the end. Uh, we intend to, to cover that uh, with her funds. Uh, down a little further on revenue, in comparison to last year, the Kilman property donation was in there last year, and the Terrell ADC money was part of the revenue last year, which of course is not this year, so that, those differences. Um, and the, the salary and benefits pretty much the same. The, Big difference there is the Christmas bonus uh, that we had one year in a lot uh, prior year. Your m and again, uh, led by travel, is still down. Uh, haven't done much traveling this year. A lot of our expenses are still down, uh, which I, I guess is a good thing. We, uh, we're going to have quite a bit of money left over at the end of this year. And I do want to point out uh, the board budget committee has seen this, but I do have uh, projections to the end of the year in here, uh, right next to the actuals. Um, and as I, I told the VPs when we met, everybody take a deep breath, but it's at this point, again, these are just projections. Uh, we're looking at $8.9 million. Now, it sounds like a lot, but we have to think about some things when we talk about that because. Um, we've got three and a half million within the budget in contingency and cap reserve. Right off the bat, that's three and a half. You've got 1.4 million from uh, the summer of last year, which is in play in a couple of agenda items here that we brought in as lost revenue with her money that's going to show up. I think it's in May. And so we just kind of had a perfect storm, and some of this is going to hit this year, and plus the, the under expenditures this year and the other health money that we're going to bring in for the fall and spring. And so um, I was going to go to the next slide unless anybody has any questions. The next one should be, uh, I believe it's cash. We'll go to the second page more. Yeah. Not much change in cash between uh, March in April, a couple of things I did want to point out. You, you see the cap reserve is at 16 million one seven. And we continue to transfer the monthly amount uh, 1.9 million that's in the budget. Um, 
this body approved paying off the bonds. You'll notice at the bottom of that page, you see that 2.4 million in the bond account. Our, our paying agent couldn't move as fast as we were prepared to move. And so it, I think the first couple of days in May, it got paid off. But paying agents, we called them as soon as that board meeting was over the next morning. We were transferring money, but they weren't quite ready for us. So it was a couple of days later. Next page. Is again your investment report. Um, again, the cap reserve there is 16170 is about the same. Um, you know, we've been building that monthly. The following page is the capital reserve activity, and there's not much going on. I know uh, y'all are going to be talking about some of this tonight, but you see the architect fees for the parking lot. That's the only thing that's come out of here. The 17,450. <laughs> you see the monthly transaction <laughs> interest at the top and one reconciling item because we, we lag them up on the transfers after we know what the expenses are. Does anybody have any questions about the cap reserve? <clears throat> I'd like to point out how much money we've got in there because it's a lot of money. Two months worth of over 25,000. The first one there is April. And if y'all have any questions other than the payroll and stuff, my distinguished colleagues can answer those. It's my IT uh, purchases. The next slide is for March. Um, Again, new IT purchases, some normal stuff in there, uh, some roof, roof maintenance. You'll see the uh, capital lease payment down at the bottom of the fitness center. Uh, I do want to point out, I believe this next budget year, we may have talked about this budget today, I'm not sure, but this next budget year will be the last of those payments that we're going to make. So, uh, and obviously, board budget committee, that'll be the only thing you'll see in under debt. The next slide, I, I did want to take a minute. This is the one I cheated you on last month. Um, this is the amount of her funds. I know this is a subject that we keep talking about for the next two years. Um, Mr. Leroux has provided us, these, these are the things that we've drawn down thus far out of the three uh, sets of her money, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. $350,000 in expenses. Uh, the room and board refund, most of y'all will call that from last year, out of this grant, and then we had lost revenue for the summer and TDCJ salaries, and that totaled $1.86 million. And we update this every month, and we felt like it was something that was important to bring to the board. Uh, it's a lot of money. The next slide, this is the one I wanted to spend a minute on. Looking down the road, this is the uh, money that's left over in the herb. You see, you see the three awards on the left-hand side, 932, it should be 620 by the way, 3.8 million and 4.8 million. All of HERF one money has been spent. Uh, we're in the HERF two. And going down the page, what you see in the red are expenses that we are committed to. We have some expenses we haven't drawn down. We have the LPC position that we committed to pay out of HERB. And the next group are this past fall and spring's estimated revenue. And you can tell by looking at those numbers and the sheet, it really hasn't changed much. We're drawing it down by semester uh, as, as allowed by the DOE. And the next page is uh, we never got to this, I don't think, much in the board budget committee, but we projected out for 2021 lost revenue. That's going to be a part of the budget. And the two things I'll show you there is you see the two $1.6 million figures. That's the amount of contact hours, success points, and so forth that the state has slided us on. I say slided because they figured out we got hurt. <clears throat> And they didn't they, they used the term hold harmless, but they sort of forgot that. 
So what I wanted to show you was projecting this out, and you hear that enrollment's going up. My estimates are that you know I've been very conservative, but even doing that, in worst case scenario, we're only eighty-three thousand dollars short of covering that loss for the second year, twenty-two-twenty-three. And I believe again what I'm seeing with enrollment and tuition fees and so forth. I don't think these numbers are going to be as bad as I projected. Again, just being conservative, just in case. And I want to stop there. Is, is anybody have any questions about that? This is the first time you've been able to see this. Okay. Uh, I, will, I intend to update this every month as we go along every semester. And as we draw money down, what, I, what you'll see is it moved to the sheet before. And we'll just roll this forward out of the two years. And I mentioned the budget committee. Um, the CFOs, as we talked, has become a lot more strategic in the way that we're having to use this money because of the contact hour laws. And that's what we're trying to do. Uh, we're not making any more purchases. Uh, we do have a couple of commitments that they threw on us in R3 that we've got to talk about among the staff. Uh, they didn't say how much money we had to spend, so I'm not too concerned. But that's kind of where we stand on her. And that's all I've got. I'm going to show you any questions. David, I think for myself, it's important that I see a set of financials <coughs> without personal. <coughs> what, what can we count on in the future that we're going to have available? Because this, this pot's going to dry up. Well. Yes, sir, it is. And, you know, I, I don't want us to adjust our spending. To her money, but that's not permanent. That's that's correct. And, and so I, I need to see a, a set of financials about it and understand yeah. what we got and what we can count on for the future. Okay. So, does that make sense? It does. Uh, of course, in the financials, I have to record it as no, a I source of funds. That. But I can always tell you going forward, we haven't drawn down the big dollars yet. Yeah. It'll, when it hits in May, what I can do is. You know, I can pull it out at the bottom so you can kind of see. I need a, I need a way to visualize it yes, so we understand. No, it is important, and that's why I want to bring this up is because uh, the well is going to run dry yes, sir. at some point. But just that's why I wanted to point that out when you see those estimated numbers. That it, when I give you projections, I want to show you everything that's coming in. But I do see where you're coming from. And I'll, as we go through the rest of the year, I'll, I'll try to find a way to pull that out so you can see both. <coughs> Thank you. You bet. <clears throat> David, that prior slide, I believe, I think it's that one, the, the uh, brackets, that, that hurt money, but the round number uh, is about a little shy of $4 million for each of this year and next year. That'd be pretty close. Oh, as far as what they allocated us? Yes. Um, it's up at the top of that slide. The first turf was only 932,000. That's gone. Uh, we had 3.8 million. We've got 2.9 of that left. Right. Right. Two. Three, three point eight. Yes, sir. Four that's, point eight. That's is this the year. last. Yeah. The four, this year. Well, they piled it all together. It's really it's one pot of money now. And well, even when you look at the drawdown, it's just one big pot of money. And the way they, the, the guidelines that we've gotten is this last bit, the 4.8, May the um, 11th to 14th is when that became available. You have one year to spend it, but you can get a one year extension. You get it or you can ask for it. Well, you can draw it down. You, the, the grant period as it stands initially is one year, yeah. which is next May. Now, they've got some verbiage in there that's a little tricky, but obligated, not obligated, and all that. But they, they are saying they are giving a no-cost extension of one year, only on the institutional side. And I think, again, I, that's my opinion. I think that's what the state is looking at between your first year and that second year extension to, to make up for that uh, contact hours. 
That was what was in their mind at that time. Okay. Have a uh, comment. I think you and your staff have done a great job in laying this out. So very good, clear. Um, my question: What happens if you don't spend all the money? Are we stuck with that? Do we go and send it back? Or oh, I take it back. Okay. So, <laughs> are we better off in spending what they send and ask us to use those monies as allocated? Well, if you. If we get down, if we were so fortunate that things went well, and my figures were wrong about you know right now we don't even have enough to cover it. But you always have the option; they're encouraging us to. You can always give it to the students. So, in my opinion, it, it, rather than give it back, if we got down to that point in the second year, I think we want to give it to the students. Okay. And then you know they, they encourage that obviously. So. Yes. Anyone else have any questions about the <clears throat> financial and investments? If not, I hear a motion that they be approved as presented by David. Jerry makes that motion. Terry seconds that motion. All in favor say aye. All opposed, like sign. Motion carried. <clears throat> Item number seven. Consider and discuss construction of additional parking at the Terrell Health Science Center. Board, we, Randall. We do. We have Randall Scott here with us. Randall, you want to come forward? Where Where are you? There are you. Oh, there you are. Um, right. We've been, as, as you guys know, we we talked about three years ago when we talked about the Health Science Center and renovation. Uh, we talked about the possibility of this parking lot. But we decided that we would wait until the until the work was done, see how much it cost, make sure that we didn't run into any problems that we didn't foresee initially, and and we done we've done that, and so we ended up with what well, Randall can tell you, but we ended up with uh, eight hundred thousand dollars left over, uh, and so we think that we can use that for the parking lot. Come forward, Randall. Yes, clients would like to Okay. Do that now. Okay, you can do whatever you want to, Randy. You're a big guy. So, for 13 years, I've ever been to the board meeting. Turn your mic on. Um, uh -huh. Is it hurt? Well, it's hurt. No. Okay. Yeah. okay. 13 years, I've been coming watching you guys give plaques out and <laughs> honor other people, and, and I never see anybody honor you guys back. I'm sure people do. Uh, it was a it was an honor and a privilege to partner with you on the design of the Health Science Center, and I think it turned out amazingly well. I think most everybody will agree to that. In honor of that, uh, we've had some uh, photographic plaques made with each of your names. Those of you who were members of the board when we did that, I'm sorry, I don't have one for <laughs> new members, <laughs> but uh, that I wanted to hand them out. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Let me say something just to me. And I, I want to thank the board. I want to thank Randall for the work he did and our entire team. Uh, when you were talking about Jeremy, talking about Helen, I, all I thought about was he just didn't know we had our secret way. And Helen is our secret way. She's held that nursing school together through thick and thin, and uh, I will always appreciate that. Uh, I think that I tell people in Terrell, Heaven, had, when I came to Terrell 34 years ago, I came back to Terrell to start practicing medicine. <coughs> this facility, uh, you know, it, it's, it changed a lot over the years, and most of it's gotten better. Uh, but I tell people in Terrell now, when you walk in this building now, it is an old wild law, and you have to have appreciated what it was before. And it is literally an old wild law, and, and I think uh, we need to, to be thankful for that and appreciate that we had the opportunity to do it. There's a lot of people that were good, that worked toward that, 
in cooperation with the city of Terrell. And that took a little while, but I, it really is an overall moment. I encourage everyone to come back. Hey, much. Hope you guys enjoyed us. Put them up on your walls. Remember what a great thing you guys did for the students at TVCC because I think it's an amazing project. All right, tonight I'm here to talk to you about the parking lot expansion. Uh, as Dr. King said, we uh, value engineered uh, the parking lot expansion out. It wasn't an alternate at the time. Uh, the cost of it's gone up a little bit since we originally estimated it. Uh, I think the alternate itself is about 450000 as it stands today. The cost is about Five sixty-three. Um, so, but that's kind of the, the price of waiting. Things never go down unless we look. Um, can we get the site plan up? Next slide, please. Yeah. Next one. Yes. So, what you see there uh, in the red, hatched in the red at the bottom, is the parking lot expansion. The gray parking is what's there and what was able to be put in and in the original construction. And we had the uh, preliminary design done for the expansion, at least the part in the bottom left hand part. If you remember at the time, we had a professional building there. So um, it was decided that we needed to preserve that money for unforeseen conditions in the building that we didn't know much about, which was a wise thing to do, I think. Anyway, at this time, there's still money left in the budget. and. Um, the college has decided they would like to move forward um, with proposing that. We had it bid out. We had five bids come back. Um, we're, we're proposing integrity contractors at roughly $562,000. Um, and so that's where we stand there. There was an ad alternate in this for an additional 33 spaces. This is going to buy us basically 152 new spaces. So. With the 117 that we currently have, that'll be able to be, the site will have 269 parking spaces if we just do the base bid. Uh, we can do an, an alternate for the other 33 spaces, and that will get us to 312. So that's a board decision. The scope of the work is new concrete paving, striping of the paving. You know, there's parking lot lighting. Uh, the city requires a certain amount of landscaping for their um, digital ordinance, their landscape ordinance. Uh, we have conduits to a future monument sign out on the street to the west of our parking. And uh, it completes the original bus drop that we originally wanted to put in, but uh, didn't have the money for originally. So, so now that's part of the parking lot that you see there in the red hatched area. The purple hatched area is, is the future 33 spaces, and then we left a space of, for approximately 14,000 square foot future building uh, to the south. So that's kind of the overview of, of the, uh, the parking lot expansion. We think we've identified the best value contractor, which is tailoring contractors out of Allen. And David, if you want to talk about the rest of the financials, I think this is probably more, you're the one to put that together, so you probably have better information about that if anybody wants to go through the rest of the numbers. Any questions? Is there a recommendation up here? Is there a recommendation up here? Yeah. What's the value of doing that now? About 90, 92,000. About 92,000. Yes. Which is really a pretty good value. I mean, that's 33 spaces. That's, 3, yeah, 3,000 dollars a space. That's uh, that's well below what the market is right. David, do you want to? Talk about the bid process itself. Thank you, Randall. Thank yep. you for the plaque. That's really yeah, nice. You, Very well, good. You were a big part of that as well, by the way. You know that. We've been working together on it for 13 years. It's a long way from that little group. It's a part of the process to, to purchase the additional parking. Put together with Luana and myself and Randall as a team. We put together an RFP, sent it out to the world. We probably send out 50 to 60, maybe even 100. 
And, uh, and some of those folks that, that are on our mailing list are advertisers, and they advertise it in their uh, publications. So it went out pretty widespread. We had uh, four general contractors, and then a, a painting company returned uh, bids to us, basically built in two groups. Uh, the lower group and the higher group. We asked for a guaranteed max price. When we uh, built this building, that was the methodology that the board we chose uh, to build the building back. So I chose as a part of the process to, to continue that so that the pricing that we are telling you tonight are guaranteed max prices. Uh, and, and it's what we asked for. We didn't get it in one of the cases, but but uh, uh, at the initial bid, but we've got guaranteed max prices from all of the contractors at this point. Integrity is by far the, the leading uh, cost and most effective uh, to do the work for us. I have rarely talked to uh, others parties that use contractors <clears throat> and they and they speak very you know they did the job they did good but I I can tell you I got some really glowing reports about tech never heard of them never used them uh, don't know much about them but these folks that I contacted uh, had used them for building schools uh, state schools, uh, mostly in the high school and the lower grades, but they had built 10 to $30 million projects for these folks, and they just loved them. One guy said, I won't tell them guys this, but they're the best contractor. I love to work with these guys. They're honest. They're straight. They don't try to make a lot of money at each job, but they do really good work. So. So I, I am, uh, as many problems as we've had uh, in that arena with this uh, project, I'm looking forward to trying to work with some that say that they're the best. And if Helen was here or she's online, uh, we, after we interviewed those folks, the excitement was just building in her she was so excited about this book. And uh, so I'm, I'm pleased to offer this to you. We've still got some issues there at the campus that we've got to deal with. Um, we've got some movement issues still over where the old building connects to the new one that we've, and we've got to deal with. Uh, as a staff member, I wanted to contribute the most money that I could contribute to make sure that we finish this job in budget. But I would love to finish this entire parking lot. But it's not my job necessarily to tell you that we ought to do this in my in my heart of hearts when I know we still got some more uh, construction work to do there. So, but we really do need a parking lot as it's proposed minimally tonight. If you if you look on the second page of the memo that was sent out to you, we have what nine hundred thirty six thousand eight hundred ten dollars that's available. That's funds available from the Health Science Academy and from the Health Science uh, construction uh, construction of the facility Health Science. Of that, we're talking about spending um, $562,777 for the for the for the parking that we're talking about, not the not the 33 parking spaces, but the standard parking. And then as you can, there's some other pro there's other costs that are expected to be in there as well that you can see on that page. Um, the the final figure, I guess you could say, the remaining board approved funds, if we were to do do the this parking lot and not the additional 33 spaces, but the standard parking, 
we would have $232,593 away in the, in the overall budget. Now what Randall, and I think what uh, David are trying to tell you is that we got some more money to spend. And Randall, you might, you might expand on that. So you may remember um, we had some issues with a part of the slab that dropped nine inches. And we removed the slab. We did work under that slab and put a new slab back in. And before we did that, we talked about as a group whether or not we should put in a subsurface drainage system because of the amount of water that was showing up after we had taken that slab out, which you guys decided to do at the cost of $15,000. And the good news is that slab and the gray beam that it is attached to are moving homogeneously. The new addition that we did for the multi-purpose building uh, community room is basically a pier and beam combination. So it's not going to move. It's not moving. But we're getting a little bit of movement that's going on in that existing building. Uh, it's raised about an inch and a half where the connection is between the multi-purpose building that we added in the existing building. The good news is that the slab we put in that existing part of the building is moving homogeneously with its foundation. But um, normally when you build a building, in my experience in every geotech and structural engineer I've ever talked to, once three to five years has gone by, that foundation is pretty much stabilized. The moisture has moved out from under the foundation and it's not going to move around much. But this one continues to move. Uh, and about all we can do is react to that. There was no way to know going into the project if it was going to move, how much it would move, uh, but it is moving some. And we need to go in there and put some, um, some aesthetic covers over the joints where they're moving uh, and, and make some minor cosmetic changes on the inside to obscure any further movement that's going to continue to happen. So that is why the 232,593 at the bottom is a just a fund that um, we're going to need to do a few things there at that portion of the building to try to mitigate that issue. And we talked to the geotechnical engineer. His recommendation was to put uh, a moisture barrier a vertical moisture barrier in front of the existing portion of the building to try to stop water mitigation from going underneath that slab heating, which is what's causing the instrument. <laughs> um, and then inside, we need to do some cover plates, <coughs> modify some, some minor changes to the interior finishes to cover up that movement. Um, and so, anyway, that's what we're recommending we reserve that 232,000. How much of that it'll take, I don't know yet, but we needed a general contractor on board to be able to assimilate that work. We needed somebody who could get in there with us, do a little bit of investigative work and help us uh, with the final scope that needs to be done there. The, uh, the, uh, the stoop that's outside the west door between the community room and the existing building <coughs> also heaved. Uh, it's flat work, so it's, there's not really any work um, underneath it that's done structurally to keep it from moving. And moisture has mitigated underneath there. It raised it to the point where the door wouldn't open. And uh, David and his group removed the stoop and put in some uh, what we call DG, which is granite that's decomposed, and lowered that so that people can get out the door in a matter of egress, which is a good thing. But ultimately, what needs to happen there is that needs to be a structural stoop that is built like the community room so that it won't move. Uh, according to the geotechnical engineer, uh, there's a like an underground stream that runs under that existing portion of the building that's causing, he told us that a long time ago, that causes that thing to heat you some. And there's just really not much we can do about that except just to react to it. Try to mitigate it as best we can. So that's 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 what this money is intended to be used for. Is that amount adequate? I think it is. More than adequate? I hope it is. I just don't. I, 
I need a contractor in there working in tandem with us to, to get some pricing put together. But I don't think it'll be that. If, if we knew there was a moisture problem to begin with, why wasn't a moisture barrier installed when this was put in? Because typically a building that's been sitting there for 50 years has done is stopped moving. In, in the geotechnical engineers I've talked to, structural engineers, in my experience, typically a building after about three to five years has stopped. Whatever movement's going to happen has already happened, and the moisture has percolated out and underneath the building. So what you need underneath the building is you need constant moisture, just like in your house. You know, if, you, if it dries out, it gets wet, the house, that foundation is going to heave and it's going to move. And uh, there's really not much you can do. We're not sure a, that that's going to solve the problem. It's, it's, a, it's an idea. Okay, it's something we really want to try. But it's like when you buy a used car or you buy a used building or a used home, you do the best you can to investigate what the issues are and try to deal with them when you're in the construction phase or in the home buying phase or, or when shortly after you buy a car, but you can't you can't know what all the issues are going to be with an existing building like this. And there was no reason to believe that there would be an issue there. It's just we expected that building to be stabilized after 50 years of being in place. Will there not be any warranty with that? I don't think so. I mean, that was an existing building. So the foundation, the problem is the foundation underneath that building is not a quality foundation. It's a lot like the type that you have at your house. Most houses are slab and gray. And they're subject to the whims of moisture and drying out of clay, which expands and contracts when it does that, it heaves and, um, and sinks. And when we were doing the building, the slab in this area had dropped nine inches. So we tore that out, we put in select fill, we put in a drainage system, which is all I know to do, and put a new slab in there after we filled it in and got all the And fortunately, that's all moving commodity together now. We're not having a differential settlement. So we had nine inches of drop in that slab and, and the grade beam and foundation that we were, were supporting. But um, it's moving a little bit now homogeneously, and there's just there's really nothing you can do about that to stop that. You know, if a foundation sinks, you can put jacks underneath it and jack it up and support it. But if it heaves, there's no way to really pull it down or keep it from heaving. Except to try to mitigate, try to try to uh, minimize the amount of moisture that you put on here. And like I said, I've I've never used that before. That was just something that the GFA threw out as a possibility. It's kind of like a tree root guard, if you know what that is. So we're we're looking at whatever opportunities we can find to try to mitigate that. But I don't think there's any. I don't think there's any way to really stop it. It's just something that we're going to have to do. With. If, if there's no other questions, I guess what we're asking is for you to be able to authorize us to enter into a contract um, with with a guaranteed maximum price that's been determined here with Tegrity contractors using these excess available funds from the Terrell Health Science Center and the Academy project. Let me have a question. I can answer that question kind of in general. Um, I think they didn't give a guaranteed maximum price. And when they came back in, they they ended up giving a guaranteed maximum price and it was higher. Also, some of the, they didn't have the reputation that Segrity had. Many of the same individuals that worked for the previous company that did the construction for, for us there were the same companies that were the same employees that worked for Paragon. Does that answer your question in a nice way? Uh, it, it moves in that direction. Okay. Uh, I guess I'm curious that, uh, are you saying that there are 505 of pencil material difference, you know, it's more than 10% higher for the integrity? Mm -hmm. And if they were deemed unsatisfactory, okay. uh, 
I think I'm saying both. That's, that's, it wasn't their guaranteed maximum. They gave that number in their, it was, in their it was bid. Not. Was it not. was not. And then we, now David asked them the question in the interview that we had with them, are you willing to guarantee that price? And so they said, no, that's a budget number. And so they said, we'll get you our final number in by Thursday of the day and a half later noon. And it came back. It came back up to 700,000. So their number really wasn't 5 and 5, it was 700,000 <clears> percent. <throat> well, that's what I was trying to get at. Yeah. The, the price really was not 505, guaranteed in the same context. Yes, sir. Okay, got it. Any other questions? Anyone else have any questions? And this does include the the Deluxe option with the additional 33 spaces, etc. No, this is the base bid. It's 152 spaces additional. Which gives us in the which gives us 269 total spaces. The other 33 would give us a total of 312. But we discussed that pretty much at length with um, with Helen, and I think she's she's reasonably comfortable with the, with the base bid. And that's not to say that we couldn't add the other 33 in later date, even what this contract is on. I feel better about the other 33 if I lived with the other. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we were too. It's kind of why we recommend the, the base for now. Let's see what the other's going to cost, and then we'll know that we can afford the last 33. I think we can live with that. We do I hear a motion to approve it. Yes. Okay. Steve made the motion. My second. Seconds the motion. <clears throat> Any further discussion? No, I won't say aye. Aye. All opposed, line. Okay. Right, sign. Motion carried. <clears throat> Item number eight consider and discuss. Consider and discuss the final 5 5 of 2022 budget workshop tax rate hearing and adopted option in September board meeting. I think David Hopkins again has provided you with that information. If anybody has any questions about it, this is pretty. This is a little bit different than we did, have done in the previous years. Um, last year we were able to do it a little bit differently as well. But we're able to get it all done in August instead of having to wait into last previous years we had to go into September. But this time we're able to get it all done in August. You want to talk about that for a second, David? Yeah, I, I don't know that this legislature has changed anything since last time. We're only required to have one public hearing. And unlike previous years, we can also vote on the tax rate at that same hearing. So assuming that we are able to meet somewhere around August 11th and take that vote and we then have to place it in the newspaper and that gives us time to meet the August 30th um, time frame so that we can both adopt the budget and the tax rate after the public hearing. Uh, if something has changed that I'm not aware of, I can certainly come back to you, but I'm not aware of anything. <clears throat> I don't recall prior years we had to go into September because we had two public hearings and all that, and two postings in the newspaper. So that's that's the plan for now. We would ask for approval of that. Okay, of that calendar. date. Of that date yeah, the calendar. I'll make a motion to approve that. Okay, Dr. Charlie makes a motion. Ron seconds motion. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. All opposed, like sign, close the carriage. Item number nine, consider and discuss the engagement letter for annual audit. David, do you want to sure. discuss that? Uh, as we do every year, this uh, is the engagement letter from Gallup Morgan. Um, we'd like to get it done now because they, they like to come in and do the interim field work prior to year, which is helpful. Um, Price, they're, they're pretty much the same, 63.5 without the state single audit, which we did not have to have this last year. 
Uh, if we had to have that, that would be another 6,000. Uh, and again, this obviously comes from the board because they're near all the I think they've done a pretty good job. Uh, Kevin and his bunch, very, very helpful to Stephanie and I and, and to help us work through some things. And I think most of the board every year he interviews some of the board, most of y'all have met Kevin. I think uh, his crew's doing a pretty good job. Anyone have any questions? Any more questions about the company? If not, I hear a motion to be approved. So, David makes a motion to approve that. Uh, Dr. Terry seconds the motion. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, like sign. Motion carries. Item number 10 is consider and discuss purchase of two TVCC passenger. Buses. Boy, this is something that we discussed last year, last summer during the board budget committee meetings. And um, we decided that because we didn't know, even know if we were going to have athletics in the fall and the spring of next year that we would put it on hold. But we're coming back with you again. It's probably a pretty good way to do it here as well, that it did have to wait a year. But uh, we're coming back to you asking for approval to purchase two buses. Um, the, uh, there's some, a lot of justification in here, really kind of boils down to safety. Um, the, the two buses that we have are currently are 32 passenger buses. They were purchased in 2009 and 2010. They're, they're, um, they're not as reliable. They're not reliable, I guess, as, as, as we need for our buses to be, um, so it comes down to safety. It also comes down to the fact that we are, we've added some programs, some athletic programs, which, which, which will increase the usage of buses uh, in this next year. And it also really comes down to an investment. Um, we're spending, if you look on the second page of the memo that was sent to you, we're spending, in 17, 18, we spent $59,403 on uh, um, leasing buses. In 1819, we spent $65,139 leasing buses. In 1920, we spent less because we didn't have athletic programs after March, early March. And then in 20, 2021, this year, we didn't spend as much either because we didn't have, the seasons were cut short and we didn't have as much going on. On the average, I think we're probably gonna be spending about in the future about 60,000 a year on um, on leasing leasing buses because the two buses that we have are not are not enough and and probably to some degree unsafe in my opinion and so um, if you look at it from an investment standpoint if we we probably will have to spend some for leasing in the future just we're going to have to because of conflicts that come up but if we spent seventy five percent of that sixty thousand a year on uh, on new buses, uh, that would be 45,000, about 45,000 a year. In 10 years, we pay off two new buses. 11 years, we pay off two new buses. So I guess looking at it from an investment standpoint, it, we think it's the, it's the right thing to do going forward. Looking at it from a safety standpoint, we think it's the right thing to do. And uh, we just, uh, we're, we think it's time. So I guess now, I know there's a lot of information in there. I'm gonna let I'm gonna let David talk about the HERF money and how that's working. Basically, we're using HERF money to pay for this. We're not using budget money. We're not using any. We didn't put any budget money in the budget this year for it because, like I said, we didn't know when we were making the budgets out this year we were gonna even have athletics. So we're gonna be using HERF money, and I'm gonna let David explain that. Let me so, ask one question. Sure. Do you really think we're gonna use these 11 years? I think we'll use them 20 years, 25 years. Really? These are That's diesel. Right. These are diesel buses. The ones that we have before are gasoline buses. And diesel buses are supposed to go 500,000 miles or more. And so I think they'll go, correct. I could be corrected, but I think they'll go 20 years. I won't be here in 20 I years. Say they won't go that long. I won't be here. But I got an expert back there in the back of the room that tells me that those, these diesel bus, buses will last. How long, Leon? How many miles? You can do 500. Okay, 500,000 miles. Depending on which engine you get. 
We're going to keep the two, old, two older ones. We're going to use them for local purposes, transporting. But you said a moment ago that, in your opinion, they were unsafe. I'm not going to, I'm not, we would not take them out of town. We would use them for local purposes. I, I, it's unsafe when you're driving to New Mexico or when you're driving to Arkansas or when you're driving to Louisiana or when you're going down to South Texas. But when you're going to uh, Athens High School gymnasium or field house, it's not unsafe. That's so our recommendation again we uh, we spent a lot of time over the last couple of months looking at this this we believe that you can buy used buses you can buy new buses we believe that you can buy better you can probably get a better deal with used buses I think Leon has spent uh, you've been to about four or five different locations looking at buses already um, they're out there um, it's kind of like buying a used car or a new car you just have to decide which direction that you want to go. And uh, uh, Navarra College just got through buying, how many did they buy, four? Three. They bought three at Navarra. I have a picture of those. Uh, Norma, you want to bring those up? But Navarra College, and they bought two used ones and one new one. And the two used ones they bought were 2017 models. And I forgot how many miles they, uh, Michael Landers said he had on them, but they're very happy with them, very pleased with them. Um, so, I mean, I think it's, it's, a, it's a decision that it would have to be made at some point, but what we would like to do is have that opportunity to make that decision. We'd like to have a, a, we'd like to have a cost not to exceed 500,000 and for us to buy what we believe would be in the best interest of the college moving forward, where that could be used or could be new. Those, the bus that you see on the screen, those are the buses that they bought over, over at Navarra College. You see the, the uh, bull, bulldog on the outside. We would have that. I think that costs, what, 18, 15 to, 18, 15 to $20,000 to have a full TBCC all the way around it so everybody knows who we are and where we are. It's good advertising for the, for the college. That would also be included in, in this $500,000. And David, why don't you go ahead and mention about the HERF funds? Yes, Board, as we discussed, uh, we have drawn down this year in the fund from last summer, uh, 1472510 uh, To do this this year, what I, my recommendation would be is to do whatever the cost winds up being, we would move the revenue and the expense into the budget to reflect your action if you took it uh, and buy it out of those, lot, that lost revenue money that's excess from last year. In the way I would propose that the board wants to do it. And I believe we did talk about keeping only one old bus. Well, we talked about maybe keeping both of them, but one would yeah, probably be the only one that we'd ever use. Right. I mean, unless it was for around campus. Uh, David, help me here. You, you've already projected the hope fund in its entirety for just next budget year and the one following. So, so how how does how does five hundred thousand dollars for buses relate to that? Well, when we say HERF money, we're not. This is the money that we received. The the action that we took with HERF was to collect lost revenue. Mm -hmm. Now that that cash has come in, what are we going to do with it? Now, in my projections, you saw the excess. The way this would work out is all that money comes in this year. The 1.4 is excess, not even related to this budget year. You and I have talked about that. But instead of having eight million dollars left over, we'd have five hundred thousand less left over. If in fact we did that, I just want to be sure, buddy. We're not buying this with her grant money. Yeah, that's no, not. No, you're not. Okay. <laughs> not. I don't look good in orange, so you're not. But that's. I, I just want to say this: that that excess funds, this would. Back that off by five hundred thousand dollars. What we would have left from that money to be brought in. And we believe if we spend this five hundred thousand, it's an investment. That we're going to spend less in expense over the next yes, two years. We, we should. Yes, we should. And, and that's you know I think the justification for it. And, and you know, hey, I don't want my kids going off on, on a trip on the bus. I got to work. 
Well, even if we were doing the same thing, you still got two soccer teams you got to get somewhere, I mean, even if nothing else happens. So, I want to ask one more question. If you have buses like this, who are your drivers? What's the program for that? Are they, they got other jobs here? Are they full time drivers? Yeah, you know, special drivers? What are we doing? <laughs> well, I'm your second driver, I'm the director. Uh, we have Donnie Morris who's been with us since 2009. He drives. He's retired tech stop. Okay. Uh, we have um, Joe Mosley, as you all know, uh, who drives far since well. Uh, and we have a new driver. So we've actually got four drivers in our pool now. Okay. And y'all feel good about all that. So. Yes, sir. That's critical. So. But you also have coaches driving as well. Is that correct, Leon? They can, yes. So, Dr. King, my final question on that okay. is that what you're looking for is approval without specifying exactly what other than buses along the lines that we just talked about here, Mr. Chair, up to $500,000. Okay. Comfortable that we can do that. I am comfortable. There's no conflict with, with uh, the board, doesn't know what it's really approving specifically. Uh, or is it causing to be from some state vendor? Uh, you sort of getting oh, it. Will be, it will be obviously a legal purchase from state, that's, for, for that standpoint, but there's no way for us to know right now exactly what bus it is. I mean, it won't, we won't know until the day of. No, but normally you would, you would get an RFP out there or something like that. We would have bids and then we would talk about it. But you can't do that with, with this. Cannot do that. No. Because you don't know from one day to the next what's available, what's not available, what's out there, and what's not out there. If you could, we would, yeah. but you can't. I mean, we 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 don't know what's out there. We know what's out there today, but we don't know what out, what's out there tomorrow. I, I'm just confirming yeah. that it yeah. fits all the boxes as far as the. If, if it definitely, uh, we've already checked with with the people that we need to check with. It fits all the boxes. You just have to trust us that we're going to make the right decision, and I trust Leon. That wasn't the issue. Yeah. The issue really was: is there is there any anything we need to be concerned about? No. All right. Any other questions? Do I hear a motion? Then it will. Mike makes a motion. Yeah. Approve. Approve it. David, you second motion. All right, motion has been made to check it. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed like so. Motion carries. Item number 11, <coughs> consider and discuss faculty contract renewals. This is something, as you know, board, we do every year in June, and that is we renew the contracts for our faculty. And uh, we, we have a list of them here. It's basically, we, we do not have any non-renewals. So it's basically, this is a list of our faculty that we're, we are renewing, asking for you to approve renewal for next school year of 2021, 2022. Anybody have any with that? David, you on second, uh, make that motion? Okay. Ron seconds that motion. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. <coughs> All opposed like sign, motion carries. Item number 12, consider and discuss administrator's contract renewals. This is the board, this is the same thing we do each year. Uh, as you recall, we a decision was made in September 1 of 2016 that we would not give any new administrator um, a contract after that time frame, and we're, we're not. So we're asking that the board approve the renewal of contracts for all currently employed TBCC administrators that were hired prior to September 1 of 2016 for 2021-2022 school year. And there's a list on here as well. Okay, Dr. Charlie makes that motion. Second. Uh, Dr. Terry seconds that motion. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. All opposed, right side. Let me say one more thing about the bus driver. I just want to make sure. <laughs> I would really like for coaches to be out of the bus driving business. I recognize there are times that that may have to be the case, but and, and 
our day and time, the ability we have and our kids to do better buses and coaches should not have to drive the bus to get their kids home. I don't think they do, Dr. Charlie. I, I, I don't recall any time, I, I just, unless it was just an absolute emergency somewhere. Yeah, I don't that they couldn't, but I don't want it to be an expectation. I, it's not. Definitely is not. That'd be more like just a local transfer? Not even that. I don't even think they do that. They may do it with a 15 passenger, which they're allowed to do. But I don't know that they even have CDS. Do yeah, they have CDS? I don't, know. I, just, I don't think they do. I may, there are times may be wrong. thanks to the next expectation. It is not with us, Dr. Charlie, and I appreciate you saying that. You don't want to drive anymore, do you, Terry? Come on. <laughs> I, don't, I don't. These coaches get back at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning from trips that they go on, and you're Terry's exactly right. Yes, right a bit. Okay. Respond. I, I, that that I, I appreciate you saying that, because that's very true. Yeah. Did we, we had approval on that play. We voted on this. Yes, we did. I think. Okay. Yeah. Number 13, consider and discuss personnel updates. And, and you have a list of those. That these are your standard resignations and retirements and new hires and re adjustments or promotions. I will note that we do have one, one re retirement that I wish that we didn't have, and that's Jeff Watson over in Palestine. Uh, he's retiring in December, and we'll be replacing him. So that's something. He's been here for 10 years. Doesn't seem like he's been here that long, but he has. We have to accept we don't. We, I wish we didn't, but he, he. I don't think he. He would like it too much if we didn't. So um, I just asked for the approval for that. Okay, approval of personnel. Steve makes that motion. Uh, Jerry seconds that motion. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. All opposed, like sign. Motion carries. Item number fourteen. Uh, convene to executive session in accordance. No, 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 no. That's not it. This, we didn't do that. Oh, we didn't do that. We just, this is this is it right here. Oh, consider and purchase. The, uh, okay. Yeah. So we're not going into. No, 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 no. That that changed. Okay. All right. Consider and discuss uh, purchase of nimble storage area. What is that? Additional network. Yeah, it's a, it's called a SAN, S A N, and you probably know about as much of it about as, as I do. But we do have some experts. We have some experts, I think, that are on the on the Zoom meeting. This came up, and the reason I added this to the agenda is because it came up last week. We have it. This was something that was put in the budget for next year. It, it was um, $98,000, I think, or $95,000 that was put in the budget for the 21-22 year to purchase. And it came up last week that we could buy that now uh, and we could save $12,000. And we, I talked to, do you have the funds in your budget now to be able to do that left over? And they do. And so we could transfer funds over, current funds over, uh, save $12,000. We have to purchase it between now and July the 1st. That's why I had to put it on the agenda today. And, um, and then we can also deduct it from next year's budget. 98. 95 or 98, I never can remember. $98,000 from next year's budget, if we can buy it now. And she provided a list on the second page of items that, that she has available in her budget currently that she has not spent, that she is willing to use to, to go ahead and purchase this with. So um, I'm gonna stop right there. I, Alicia, are you on the line? Alicia or Brett? They're going to answer any questions that you may have. You can read what it does here. The device that I remember the device that we bought because we bought it was one of the first things we bought when I became president five years ago. Yeah, Gary. Yeah, go ahead, Brett. Tell uh, us a little uh, bit about what we're doing. Okay. You, you, I mean, everything you said was, was really accurate, but we, we have a replacement cycle for all of our hardware devices. And the next year was coming the time that uh, we needed to buy a SAN. SAN, S-A-N means storage area network. And to think of it simply, it just stores a ton of data. So um, I'm gonna let Alicia tell you why we needed to purchase one next year. Uh, but the, the numbers were 95,000 that we, if we buy it next year, and, and she you know, got the, 
the amount to put in next year's budget and she we were, were going to request ninety five thousand dollars but we found out that there's a hewlett packard promotion she found out she came to me with this um through june 30th and the the salesman kind of let her know at, at, at a late date but we found out we can save more than twelve thousand dollars if we purchase it before june 30th and and we've got a PO ready to go. That if it's approved tonight, that uh, it's it's going to be sent through tomorrow. We're going we're to tell him it's a, it's a go. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Alicia now. She is our director of system support services, and she is the one that's responsible for maybe saving us this twelve thousand dollars. So Alicia, yes, sir. Um, just to kind of give you a short idea of what this is. It is a storage device, but what it stores are files that run our whole organization because we're a virtualized environment. It runs everything we do. And the device we have now is five years old. And there are companies like Elucian and others that are telling us, you know, it's not up to hardware standards, but either way, it goes end of life. We were able to get them to give us a little bit more leeway on when they will end of life it, but in December of this year, the one we have will go end of life, which means they will not support it. So if anything happens with our mission critical data, we're just stuck. We won't have support for it. So we've got to replace it either now or next budget year. So we've, we've had a lot of really good pricing and discounts with our vendors as far as software contracts and things. So I have this money left over. And so I was hoping we could just go ahead and get it and get it out of next year's budget for you guys. Thank you, Alicia, and thank you, Brad. Does anybody have any questions? Pretty good deal. I, I didn't need it. That's why I had her write all this. I'll make a motion that we do. All right, you make a doctor makes a motion. David seconds that motion. Ron, Ron did. Mr. Mr. Day, yeah. Ron. Mr. Day. Ron Day, second motion. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, like sign. Motion carries. Thank Adam, you. Lawana, I'll send you a PO in the morning. Item number 15. Oh, we're getting down here just about down and gone. Mm -hmm. uh, discuss the 2021 job classification and salary study. Boy, this is this came up at our budget meeting that we had last Thursday, and it was it's part of our plan for moving forward in the future. And I have Janine Dots here to talk a little bit about it. She's going to give you a brief overview. What we'd love to be able to see happen is for um, the the uh, the board to give us a nod, yes, that we you'd like for us to move forward with this, and that we work out the details with the board budget committee over the next two or three weeks. And, and then come back again to the board, full board in August, or actually late July board meeting, or mid August board meeting and talk more about it and give you more information and work out whatever details or whatever needs to be worked out. I will tell you this also, I, I, I brought this up last year, last summer again, during our budget workshops. And I did uh, talk about the fact that since we weren't getting a pay raise uh, this year, 2021 year, that I thought this would be a great year to do this study and because I just felt like it would be a good time to do it. And so Janine has spent and her staff have spent hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours working on this. They've done an excellent job. They've had everybody review it, VPs, executive committee, other people review it. And uh, I just like for her to kind of give you an overview and then we can kind of go from there and see what you want to do. Janine. Thank you. Uh, it's wonderful to be here tonight. I want to just thank everybody for allowing me the opportunity to come share this. Uh, it's a lot of hard work that we put into this. I'm very proud of it. Um, and I'm proud of the staff. Um, this was a collective effort uh, for the whole college. Excuse me. So, you know, we went all the way down to the employee level and asked for input from them and worked our way all the way up to the top and asked for input um, all the way through. So it truly is a, a complete college effort um, in this in this study. Um, and I do want to especially thank my staff, um, Amanda Beltran, uh, she's my right hand, my right hand girl, and she did so much work involved in this. We also had a part-time person 
that used to work with us that came in and also that's Casey Brock. She helped out tremendously with this project. Um, but my other two staff members, they kind of picked up the slack where we weren't able to, to pitch in during this time. And so they, they're they rock stars as well. And so without all of us um, chipping in and doing what we need to do, um, this would not have been able to happen. So uh, it's a pleasure to meet you, Dr. Eason. Uh, <laughs> welcome to TVCC. <laughs> um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. So really tonight, what I'm going to do is just kind of introduce things to you. We're going to go over project elements. I'm going to talk about some of the important goals that were um, part of this study. Um, I'm also going to just briefly describe a, a phase two process that we also would like to do at some point. Um, I'm going to talk about the journey uh, and, you know, just a brief review of the process of how we uh, went through the whole study. Um, I'm going to give you some of the market study results um, and the methodology behind some of it the, and the implementation. And then I'm going to talk at the end a little bit about how we got here um, and why we have found that this is um, important for the future of the college. So at the end of 2020, the college president requested that we do a salary study. Um, and we also look at um, our classification system as well. Um, this was in response to a multitude of issues that we are experiencing here at the college. And some of those are attracting new employees, uh, retention of existing employees. We have high rates of internal transfers to new positions. And a lot of those are solely just for money. We have an increasing number of hard to fill positions a lot of these things are affecting our employee morale, and we have inconsistent internal equity comparisons. I can tell you that from the moment I was hired here at TVCC in July of 2015, there I could sense that there was issues within the compensation system. And I can tell you from the moment Dr. King became president, um, I have asked every single year to be able to conduct one of these studies because I feel that um, passionate about how important it is that we have something in place that is transparent, um, that is scalable, and that we can use uh, that will be that can last for a very long time. This is not something that you just do for one year and then it's over. It is something that will continue um, to be able to be um, managed. Um, so some of the elements that we addressed are organizational alignment, um, compensation philosophy, job functions and families, market-based salary ranges, career streams, which is going to be part of our phase two, and internal equity and external competitiveness. So two of the major important goals that we looked at was we wanted to organize jobs in a way that allows us to benchmark salaries against peer institutions and create a clear job structure. And the reason why we want to do this is because we want to be competitive for the top talent. We want to create transparency and establish regular market assessments. The second goal was to establish a shared language. We want to create a standard approach to jobs and compensation across the college. The reason why we want to do this is we want to operate as one college. Identify comparable work at comparable levels regardless of existing titles. The phase two is defining career progression and opportunities. This is something that I have heard from employees um, a lot over the years that there's no career path for a lot of our employees. They come here, they come in as an administrative assistant or they come here as an executive assistant, um, you know, or another position and they just don't know where they can go from that point. And so I think it's important that we define career progression and opportunities. Um, this will help with our leadership pipelines um, we're, we're coming into an era right now where we're going to start having quite a few retirements and we have a lot of historical knowledge here at the college that if we don't start um, getting those pipelines full, <laughs> we're going to start having some problems. So it's something that we need to invest in our current employees here to um, promote those that are, you know, um, have that um, skill set to be able to take us into the future. So the journey, this is a, a, just a brief review of our process. Um, we started with the project initiation and did initial meetings. Uh, we collected classification data and distributed PDQs if needed. So back in 2017, I actually did a project um, that Dr. King gave me permission to do, and that was a classification 
um, study. And it just dealt with classification, it didn't deal with salaries. And what we did was we distributed a position description questionnaire, PDQ, to all employees. We asked them to define to us what it is they do on a daily basis. Um, what educational requirements do they feel that if someone was coming into that position tomorrow, what educational requirements would they need to have? What years of experience would they need to have? Um, what knowledge, skills, and abilities does that job require to be able to be done efficiently? We also asked about their working conditions. One thing our job descriptions lacked in for a very long time was ADA language. So there was nothing defined on our job descriptions that said, you know, this job requires you to lift 50 pounds, or this job requires you to sit for extended periods of time. It's extremely important that we have that documentation so employees come on and sign on with us and they sign that job description that they know exactly what they're getting themselves into and they know exactly what the expectations are. So that was a really big reason why we wanted to do those PDQs was to um, especially get that ADA language um, in our job descriptions. Um, and another thing that uh, we had talked or allowed them to do was to make sure that they told us if there was any job duties that was not listed on their job description that they do on a regular basis. We wanted to know that information. We also asked them to give us their, their uh, decision level. Uh, you know, when they have to make a decision, what level is it that they see that they make these decisions? And we wanted to have more background knowledge on what those positions were doing. So luckily, when we started this project, we had had about 90% of that already completed. We had that in our hands. So that saved us a lot of time. Um, but we did have to go back out and, and new employees who did not get an opportunity, we gave them the opportunity to do so. And, um, and also for people who changed into new positions, we allowed them to be able to review their new position to give us that updated information. So after we did that, we developed new job descriptions based on data supplied by the employees and supervisors. So after we received the job descriptions back from the employees, after giving them the opportunity, we sat down with every single supervisor and had a meeting and had them review every single job description. They probably hate me right now. They don't ever want to deal with job descriptions ever again. <laughs> um, and then after we were done with that, we actually sat down with the VPs and the VPs actually went through their departments as a whole and reviewed those job descriptions um, because they, they, first of all, wanted to know what is it that my employees are doing? Even the ones that aren't direct reports, I want to know more about what these employees are doing. And that was a great way for them to get a better understanding of what goes on in their area. So you know, overall, I think it was very productive. I think they appreciated the process. Um, and in the end, I think we have really great job descriptions that are complete and are very descriptive of exactly what our employees do. And then we collected job descriptions from other institutions. And then we collected and analyzed that compensation data and conducted a job analysis. We developed a revised classification and a, I'm sorry, we developed a revised classification and compensation plan. We conducted salary adjustment recommendations to move employees into the new plan. And then we developed and submitted a final report to the vice president and the executive cabinet. So we're just going to go over some of the market study results. These are very high level. I'm not going to get into a whole lot of detail. I know you guys received the market study um, packet and that was 46 pages worth of a lot of information to uh, take in. So I hope that you guys take the time to read through some of that. I, I know it can read like a VCR manual at times, but I tell you, it's uh, <laughs> a lot of information. Um, so for staff and administration, um, so on exhibit 3.3, which is also on page 18 of that um, salary study, uh, illustrates that the college is on average 23.3% below market at the minimum of their respective salary ranges for the survey classifications. The survey position differentials range from 77% for the housing manager classification to 0.0, I'm sorry, 0.4% for the development officer and scholarship coordinator. Of the 111 classifications with market minimum percentage differentials, 95 of those were below market at the minimum. There are 16 that we don't have data on, and that is for a couple of reasons. Either one, the position was paid on the faculty salary schedule prior, so we don't have data to compare it to, or the position, the person has been in the position for so long that we just don't have data um, from when that person was hired on. So um, I know that there was a prior salary schedule that was used even before, um, you know, the ranges that we have now, and 
that, uh, that information is pretty much obsolete. We're not going to have information. We don't have it just sitting around for us to access. Uh, 48 uh, survey positions are 20% or more below the respective market minimums. For faculty, which is also found on Exhibit 3-4, it illustrates that the college on average is 21.6% below market at the minimum of their respective salary ranges for all study schedules. Classification. The classification system being used um, was found to be generally accurate. Um, and that was partly because we did do the classification study back in 2017. It really helped us clean up a lot of that. So um, we still found that to be mainly intact um, even today. Um, while we did find some that need to be changed, um, we do uh, propose some classification changes within the current system. Um, and we have provided a comprehensive listing of those uh, changes and it can be found on Exhibit 3.1, which is also on page 14. Salary range spread. So on Exhibit 3.3, the average range spread for each of the survey positions um, is shown there. The college's range spreads vary uh, between 34.4% for the admission specialist and 76.4% for the continuing education program coordinator classification. Overall, the college has a much narrower range spreads compared to the market, which is 60%. Um, industry practice, you usually want to see anywhere from 50 to 70%. Um, based on the institutions that we looked at, um, the average are mainly, I would say 98% of them are 60%. So we decided after having discussions with the vice presidents, um, we decided to go ahead and just stick with the 60%. Next, I just want to talk about some of the methodology behind um, the salary study. So target institution criteria. Um, and I know that this may be a point of contention with some, but hopefully um, I can make sense of it. Um, so when we chose a institution, um, we definitely wanted to make sure that it fit one of these criteria. Um, it needed to be competing with the college for employees, either at a lower level or higher level positions, uh, geographically situated in such a fashion as almost to automatically be considered a competitor, institutions that are similar in size based on enrollment, Structure, structured similarly to the college and providing similar types of services, attractive to highly valued employees for one reason or another, and provided readily available data online. Um, and that last one is because of the short timeline that we had in order to get this done. I, we didn't really have the time to go out and contact institutions and ask them to send us their job descriptions if they weren't available online. That would be a very daunting task for that institution to say, can you please send me 117 job descriptions <laughs> via email, um, you know, at your earliest convenience. And so um, that was a, a key thing was trying to find that information that was readily available for us to use. On our benchmarking methodology, each unique job description was benchmarked against other institutions. Each job was evaluated based on job duties, not title. This one thing that I made sure that I was very clear about when I talked to employees about this study was that this study is neutral. And it, it, you know, in essence, it's completely neutral. It does not know who you are. It does not care how good of a job you do. Um, and that was exactly the way we wanted it to be. Um, it does not take into account anything <clears throat> at all. Um, and so we made sure that every decision was made based on job duties. We didn't take into account anything else. Each institution's job descriptions had to match our job description duties by a minimum of 70% in order to be considered a viable benchmark. Calculating the new minimum. For each position, there was a requirement to have at least three jobs from other institutions with a minimum of a 70% match. Salary data also was collected from TASB, which is the Texas Association of School Boards. Um, they offer, they do salary studies every year, not only for the um, ISDs, but they also do the community colleges as well. And we also looked at Coupa HR, which is a national group. Um, they also do salary studies every year, and we were able to uh, purchase access to those, um, that salary data, um, and it, that is a nationwide um, we felt like it was just very important to include that in our analysis so that we weren't constricting ourselves um, just to a small number of um, institutions. 
For each institution, adjustments were made to take into account the cost of living for that area compared to ours, the years of experience and educational degree differences. And as you can see in the example below, um, we put in there, we had to make sure, especially on the TASB ISD numbers, we had to make sure that the duty days matched. Um, so if the duty days were less, then we adjusted the uh, salary to make sure it matched what our duty days were. Um, and then on the degree match, so after talking with the VPs, we had quite a couple of discussions about this um, to decide what would be an app, uh, appropriate percentage to apply for degree differences. Um, based on initial criteria, um, it was quite high. If you um, kind of did the research to see the difference between someone making an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree and the difference in income, it was, it was, quite, uh, it was quite a lot. So um, after we talked about it, we agreed upon 5% per degree. So if the institution that we were studying, if they required an associate's degree and we required a bachelor's degree, then we would increase that salary by 5% to bring it up to the educational level that we're at. And we would do that vice versa. So if ours was lower, we would then reduce their salary to bring it down to our educational level. We did the same thing with years of experience. So when we calculate salaries at TUCC, um, everybody gets one year, uh, sorry, 1% for each year of experience above the required amount. Um, and that is calculated into the minimum and that's how we calculate the starting salary. So we took that same approach. So for each year of experience, it was calculated at 1%. So if the years of experience was higher or lower, we subtracted or added depending on that calculation. And then there's the cost of living adjustment. So we had two websites that allowed us to put in specific detailed cities um, or towns that other colleges are, are in. And we were able to um, calculate the cost of living difference from there to here. And we took those two numbers and we averaged them out. Um, and then that's how we came up with our cost of living adjustment. What slide are we on, Janine? Go up. There you go. So in the end, you come up with your adjusted salary or median minimum. Um, when we looked at TASB and Coupa, the uh, numbers that we got were median minimum amounts. So we stuck with that same calculation when we calculated hours. So we didn't go with the average, we went with the median, which removed any outliers. And then of course, the last column you can see there is what the percentage match was for that particular college against that job, whatever that job was. Okay, initial job slotting. To ensure that classifications are being compensated competitively in comparison to the market, we proceeded to determine the placement of classifications within the proposed salary schedules using the results of the market salary survey as a guide. After initial slotting was complete, additional adjustments were made to maintain existing hierarchy and to account for the college's understanding and knowledge for each position, which cannot be computed, I'm sorry, cannot be captured through the PDQ or salary survey processes. So, after we, and I was very transparent in when we talked with the VPs um, and the executive cabinet that I knew this was not perfect and that we were gonna have to make some adjustments and we've made some adjustments and we just asked that they come to us, they sit down and talk with us, we review the information. We wanna make sure that it's truly representative of what our employees um, are doing. Allocation of employees within the news new proposed ranges. So for employees with current salary levels that exceed the maximum level in the assigned or newly assigned range, I should say, the salary would be frozen at that level and the employee would be ineligible for any raises until the range is adjusted to allow for movement. The placement of employees within the newly proposed salary plan is based on a formula designed to address internal equity, no salary for any employee is recommended for reduction, each employee has a calculated target salary and then is recommended for placement in the proposed pay grade. No salary will be calculated above the range maximum. Regardless of an institution's philosophy concerning advancement opportunities afforded to employees, it's essential that movements in the economy and more specifically the labor market in which the college competes be addressed at system level. So one of the uh, issues that we've run into is that over the years, our salary ranges have not been adjusted. Um, now, I don't know all the exact reasons why behind that. I've heard stories, but all I can tell you is, is that they have not been adjusted. And 
we need to desperately use them. You know, we are finding it very hard to <coughs> continue to maintain and move forward and hire new employees at the current salary ranges that we have. Cost of living increases. Any cost of living adjustment should be applied to the entire plan. If the cost of living adjustment is applied to the base salary, then the employee would get that cost of living increase. Employees who are at the maximum of their salary range who are not eligible to additional compensation can receive the COLA adjustment as long as the adjustment brings them back into the range, but nothing above that. Plan implementation. We are recommending that the new compensation structure go into effect as soon as feasible, along with the recommended salary adjustments. For those employees whose current base pay exceeds the proposed salary in the new range, no change is recommended to their salaries at this time because they are paid within the proposed salary range, which reflects current market conditions. We recognize that the implementation of a new or revised compensation and classification program must consider the financial disposition, current salary levels, and other variables unique to the college. Only after all of these factors are considered can a feasible implementation program be designed. We have worked to provide an implementation option that will permit the college to address the current inequities and will provide a framework for external competitiveness. It is especially important that during the current economic times that the college retain its highly qualified workforce by providing a fair and competitive compensation program. Additionally, it's equally important that the college does not overpay for positions. The proposed implementation plan carefully attempts to balance these two important considerations. The foundation of the implementation calculation is one that is forward looking. It does not look back on how current salaries came about. The transition to the new plan is not meant to change every pay decision, promotion, or other legal changes in salary that have occurred over the tenure of the employee, nor is it meant to pretend the new pay structure should be retroactive in concept to the day the employee was hired. To the extent that any uniform formula may result in unintended consequences, there may be isolated instances where administrative adjustments will be needed to address an inequity that is not readily apparent. This is not intended to address internal equities perceived by employees that might result from previous pay structures or previous pay decisions. TVCCHR assumes that all previous salary changes were based on information that was considered valid and appropriate at the time the decision was made. As part of the overall study, observations and recommendations regarding personnel policies and processes directly related to the implementation and subsequent administration of the proposed pay plan were discussed. Implementation costs. We have calculated a target salary for each employee that fairly and equitably makes an adjustment. If the employee's current salary exceeds the target salary, then the calculations do not provide any further adjustment. No employee is recommended for any decrease in salary even if the current salary substantially exceeds the target salary. We do recommend that any employee whose current salary exceeds the target salary should continue to advance through the ranges until they reach the range maximum. No employee should re receive any additional salary adjustments once their salary has reached the maximum of the range. The recommendation is to freeze the salary until there's sufficient market adjustment to provide an increase. On exhibit 6-1, which is also on page 44, shows an implementation cost for the option that we feel is the best fit for the college. The number of employees impacted by the change are also listed with the average adjustment for those receiving adjustments and the average magnitude of the change on the impacted employees. The objective of this job, job classification and compensation study was to improve the internal and external equity of both the structure by which employees are compensated as well as the way positions relate and compare to one another across the institution. This was accomplished by analyzing data gathered internally and externally, which informed the recommendations made in this report. So by combining the market data with the internal data gathered through the PDQ process, we were able to make recommendations which improve the equity and competitiveness of the college pay structure, I'm sorry, college's pay structure and the placement of classifications within that structure. Using the market data that was obtained, for the 2021 fiscal year by adopting the proposed salary schedule and grade order list for the 21-22 fiscal year, the college's salary schedule will move to an at market for all positions at TVCC. The recommendation in this report provide, provides a competitive compensation structure internally aligned with the classification structure and system administration practices that will provide TVCC with a responsive compensation and classification system for years to come. 
<clears throat> While the upkeep of this, uh, rec of this recommended system and associated pay and classification guidelines will require work, the college will find that having a competitive compensation and classification system that encourages strong recruitment and employee retention is well worth the effort. And lastly, I just wanted to discuss some of how I wanted to look at how we got here. I really feel like right now, especially in my area and with employees, we're kind of at a crossroads. And I really feel like that we really, I really feel like we need to make a decision on how we're going to proceed in having a compensation structure here at the college. Um, since I've been here, the structure has been non-existent. And I can go back and blame the past and we can point fingers, but ultimately that doesn't get us anywhere. I just, I really wanted to bring forth a plan that we could be proud of, uh, that Dr. King wanted to uh, present to the board for approval, um, and that the employees could stand behind. Um, so some of the reasons why we're here right now is 2011, there was a failed salary study that was performed. I was not here, that was before my time. I'm speaking from stories that I've heard. Um, and due to an implementation issue, it was halted. And as a result, only a small portion of employees for the departments were studied, and only a portion of those employees received increases. Um, that left a very bad taste in the mouth of a lot of our employees who didn't get studied and who didn't get to see any benefit from um, that. And uh, I can tell you to this day, I still hear people complain about it. It has left a very deep scar in the Texas College. Our current salary range data for positions are out of date. Some are more than 10 years old. As retirements occur, especially with longer serving employees, salary data is non-existent. When this occurs, we are forced to reevaluate the salary information. This causes other positions on campus who have not been reevaluated to feel undervalued and employees are seeing positions that are being posted for a higher range. Yet the open position has less responsibility and knowledge, skill, and ability requirements. And this leads to inconsistent internal equity comparison and continues to perpetuate employee morale downward. We currently do not recognize salary caps. So we have employees who are working here today that are above the established ranges that we have in place right now. So this allows employees to be paid at a higher amount than what we have set forth. As the college continues to give raises, the salary expense for employees compounds. This is allowing for cost to costs to continue to increase with no limitations and allows for no control of expenses. Currently, our faculty salary schedule has errors, and when it was created, the methodology was flawed. This caused there for be this has caused there to be misinformation and has created a nightmare situation for HR to try and mitigate. I want to draw your attention to rows three and four and rows seven and eight in that picture. As you can see, the numbers are exactly the same. So when we are, and I just, we just ran into this yesterday, as a matter of fact, uh, I'm sorry, not yesterday, last week. We had a faculty member who's coming in that has seven years of experience. And when she called back, she said, well, you know, I have, I actually have eight. And so we said, okay, we'll give you eight. It's the same amount. <laughs> and how do you explain that? I'm sorry. I, I, you know, um, I can tell you the story behind it, but if I told you, you would probably shake your head. And it's just that the reasoning behind it was just not, it, to me, it's not logical, but it is what it is, and we've just got to fix it. Um, once I showed Dr. King this, and Dr. King wasn't even really aware that this existed, um, he was pretty appalled by it and just said, you know, they, we just can't use it. It's just not, not feasible. So um, we consistently have been in the lowest ranked salary ranges for faculty for years. Uh, this is partly because the starting salary amount uh, has not been changed since the 14-15 fiscal year. That number should be adjusted as well with, col with a COLA increase. And lastly, and then I'll be quiet. 
inconsistent internal equity. There have been salary decisions made that have created internal equity issues. For example, a guidance associate two on a satellite campus has a higher salary range than the academic workforce advisor on the Athens campus. When you reflect on the position and the associated job duties, the jobs are exactly the same. Therefore, the pay for the positions should be equal. Another example is positions paid on the faculty salary schedule that are not faculty positions. These positions have had the ability to get an increase in pay due to additional educational attainments, while other staff who are paid on a traditional salary range do not. In the past, when an employee moves to a new position, even if the salary range is less than their current position, the employee has been allowed to keep their current salary. This causes compression issues and inequity issues within the departments. And we currently have positions that we are unable to fill. We have had to qualified applicants apply and we are unable to get a salary amount that they can come to the college here for. This is especially prevalent in the accounting business office, nursing instructors, and I did leave out campus PD. That should also be listed on there as well. And I know David can speak specifically to some of the issues that he's having in his area. But, um, and that's pretty much the gist of it. <laughs> Does anybody have any specific questions for, for Janine in, or general questions for Janine? Uh, I do have a little concern. I mean, if you're going to do a study and you're going to fix things, I don't understand why somebody that's overpaid can't have to be reduced. And, and I mean, nobody wants to be reduced. Don't get me wrong. I understand that. But if you want to be fair, and that's what the call for you, I don't understand why all you can do is raise them. You can't do it. It's just a matter of do you want it fixed or do you not want it fixed? And if you want it fixed, you've got to play both sides. I agree, and that's why we definitely propose that we treat any salaries that are above the range. That's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> that's not what I'm talking about. I mean, you know, that's talking out of both sides of my mouth. I mean, I know it's high, but don't get me wrong. It, it's just, uh, it's just, I don't understand. I can tell you that we only have three employees right now that are over that. Does the board have all the same information that was presented to the budget committee? Yeah. Yes. Is it sent on to them? Yes. Okay. I guess that's in the last. Well, since we met on the Thursday, day, the day, the day we met on Thursday, I sent it the next day. Okay. And right. they got should have gotten it on Saturday. So, so, so everybody has. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. To say, and, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna dwell on it. We, we had prior conversations about this last week, uh, Thursday, and, uh, and and I'm sure we'll have more. This, this may be, uh, this may be a pathway to something better than we've had. Uh, it's uh, it, it is a bit surprising that we've had uh, professional leadership that's been sitting here for all these years and not telling board. We haven't moved this scale. We haven't changed any of that. You know, like you've done leader for five years. I don't know who's talking to who, but you know I know the board has been hearing that. Well, these scales are way out of bounds. We need to work on these scales and look at those. We, we talked about a, an increase, which usually revolve around a percentage, sometimes hard dollar amounts, and for the reasons associated with those. Okay, be that as it may, that's that's history. I'm gonna I'm gonna make this statement and then stop there. For a a, a comprehensive study that involves and impacts and impacts everyone here. And, and uh, also impacts the college fans. I, I, I think this tweaking was about a million dollar price tag. That give or take three months for, for the first time, which you want to do right now. Get, it, get this thing rolling, get it close. I believe you stated that we started this work in December 2020. I saw this work about one week ago. About a week ago. So, 
uh, you can expect me to become sufficiently educated to, to understand and agree with everything that's in there, which I, I want to do. But I can't get there in the time period. And to have it rolled out for the budget committee to take care of this. This wasn't even coming to the board. So we had that discussion in budget committee. Is that right? Now, now you're, no, you're, you're. Okay, which part's not right? The, 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 the uh, uh, information regarding this did not go to the budget committee until a week before the budget committee met. And which I got it, I, I sent it out to everybody on June 1st in an in a, in a update. I provided, in a, I provided an update talking about the study on June 1st. You can go back and look and see. I got the, I got it on May 23rd. So, I mean, again, we're, we're, I understand it's, uh, it's, it takes a lot of effort, it takes a lot of time, and it's going to take a lot of back and forth to be able to get it worked out. Yeah. Well, but I, I think you can. I, I, I'm going to, to say again that to have my attention directed to a study, I got the packet not much more than a week ago. Now, you got it. We mentioned it at an update on a right. Monday morning thing like that. Right. Not the same thing. I don't it's expect not handing Ron Day the book and saying, I, I need you to, to get with this because we're gonna we're gonna ask the board to approve uh, everything. No, we board. did not we're not asking the board to approve anything and we did not ask the budget committee to approve anything. All we were doing is bringing it up, starting the discussion of it. We're not asking for approval. We didn't ask you for approval last Thursday. It was an introduction so that you could learn more about it and so that we could we could get together and discuss it. No approval. If there is an approval, it would be at the July board meeting or mid-August board, meeting, well, which we hope would give plenty of time for everybody to discuss it back and forth, etc. Okay, all right, I'll accept that, but, but I'm still going to understand what you're saying. That's not time to, to do the work that needs to be done for, for everybody on this board to be able to, to fully grasp what's in here and what it means initially and then going forward over time. I hope that what we find, and I think the mean that he owns his job and others are involved in, I'm not suggesting that we can't make better what we have. Okay. But I think that work needs to be cannot be done in time to uh, roll it into the budget. May not can. It, it may not can. That's why we brought it up and that's why we're discussing it. So that we can determine so if it can or if it can't. That's not the recommendation that you were referring to when we opened this conversation. Absolutely not. Ask the board to Absolutely ask. not. I'm not asking a recommend. I'm asking a recommendation to have further discussion okay. about the possibility of moving forward with this. Okay. That is the recommendation that I told you last Thursday that I would come to the board tonight. <laughs> I would we would introduce <laughs> them to this information and then we would be able to have further discussion before anything's done. Well, Dr. King, to be clear, it wasn't even on the you asked me to put it on the agenda, yes, and we that did. That is correct, yeah. and that is why because I felt this was something the board needs to be engaged in as a whole. Okay. So what I'm looking for and asking to see occur is to say, let this good work continue. I'm not trying to cast it out. I'm saying provide abundant, provide more than sufficient time to do a good job of understanding what has taken your team. I said six months, maybe we need to make it five and a half to, to follow the dates that you, you mentioned. What difference does that make? But so what would be your recommendation? To do that. What's so your what's the your recommendation, recommendation is that you separate this from this budget. It's not a budget committee function to rework this thing. Okay. And and ask the board to determine who is going to be involved in, in working with that. I'll work okay. on anything that takes place here. And I'm not going to take this in under the umbrella of the budget committee and say, we'll figure all this out uh, and get it rolled into. Because we already got, we have about one month, and you know this from all the years past, mm -hmm. that, that the windows close to, to get a budget substantially constructed. We know when we vote and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. But we don't have much time to work with because some things need to come together. Okay. So take this part out, keep working on it, but let's not try to keep it in the budget. With that, I'm done. Thank okay. you. But I think if we do that, we're going to stall our entire employment process. We're already at a 15% turnover rate in this school, which is horrendous. Most of it is over money. 
uh, we've got departments that cannot get people hired over money. And the longer we stall this, the longer we put pressure on this staff and faculty. And that's not fair to them from us. I think we need to put the work in to get this done uh, during this budget committee, all of us, or at least this budget committee needs to do that. And I think this is really more of a stall process of giving these people raises than it is anything else, David. And I, I'm going to object at, at, to that. And, and if you want to make comments, Trustee Henry, direct them to the chair. Mine were directed to Dr. King and to the chair. Well, I directed because mine to I you. Will, I will refuse <laughs> your statement that it is a stall. Well, you certainly have the right to do that. I do, and I do I do very strongly. Okay. Because that would suggest some sort of sinister intent, and there is none. I think I said adequate for everyone here to understand my statement. And that statement was that this may be this may be the, the greatest step in the right direction that we need to take. But in the time we've had it, and in the time that we're working with under the framework of the budget committee, we cannot properly do that. We, I cannot properly. We do can. That. I think we can properly do that. We can properly manage this process of this salary study if we take the time to do it. And I'm not sure that's the effort that's being put into this point that we're really willing to take the time that we're going to move this weeks, months in advance. I think this is the most important part of this entire budget process is taking care of the faculty and staff that we have before us. And I think to stall that is an injustice to them. Is it possible that we could have a budget workshop? You know, and I think I've heard new that we discovered a problem. Mm -hmm. And with that problem, what can we do to fix what we've identified? Stalling, I'm not accusing anybody of anything, but if we look at it with a level head, salary has always been a sticking point in education. So we can pay our folks. We not, we're not going to pay them what they work, but it shows some type of alignment that we're looking at some growth. We realize what we've been doing over the years is not adequate. As a board, when that was presented, we immediately began to try to fix it. We didn't placate. We didn't do. We began to work together as a board to address it. And those three, four that may came out in the study that's over, pay, look at some type of structure, grandfather those to a period of time and phase that thing out. But however, we could come together as a board and put our minutes and time in to fix what's concerned. I think it'll create morale for everybody's concern. What's our job like to any other position? Currently right now, um, seven. Seven. Right, we have some at the same job, job. individual jobs. We have about 100, 118 individual unique jobs. That's only seven up here. Right. That doesn't seem consistent with what you're doing. But over the course of the year, we probably, I mean, we'll, probably by the end of the year, we'll replace about 45. Okay, I'll just I'm just trying to yeah. show <laughs> these numbers in my, in my head. If we've only got seven open positions, it can't be a terrible place to work. No. Well, I think 
one of the main issues that we're running into, um, Dr. Charlie, is that we're not able to get employees here with the current salary range that we have in place. And like I said, um, David Hopkins can speak to that exactly, that we've been trying to hire a senior accountant for how long now? Several months. And it's not due to a lack of applicants that are qualified. You know, I it's mean, it's I, I just know, uh, there's no question. I, I tell people everything I've ever tried to help them with. See, there's no way you pay your best people enough, and there's no way you pay your worst people little enough. I mm -hmm. mean, you just can't do it uh, with your benefit structures and everything. And so I I understand we have got some work to do, and I'm not against doing work. I just got to get my hands around. It. Because the one thing I'm hearing, you know, we can't hire anybody. You know, they have got seven open positions, which isn't very many. Um, I am not in city where we don't work. Right. I'm sure. I would love to be able to move forward in some way with with doing whatever work that needs to be done. I think I think we're ready to move forward if we can if we can agree upon the work that needs to be done. And whether it can be done in four or five weeks, I, I, I can't tell you that. Yeah, I mean, I can tell you I had that time. Oh, I, oh, I know. I, and you weren't, weren't supposed to. I mean, we're just supposed to have it to be able to look at. Hopefully on the next next few few days, you'll have a chance to look at it. But I understand the nursing side of things. Yeah, I'm I know. I'm sure we don't pay the nurses. We don't. We're going to have to pay more, but we're going to have to. Especially going into our end work, we're just going to have to. So I know there's work to do there. I know there's work to do in other areas. You start looking at technology people and computer people and what they can do. Yeah. I mean, that's the hardest. Oh, yeah. I don't care what business you're in. Yeah. They don't stay. And, you know, it's a challenge. But I know we've got to work to do. And I'm, I'm certainly willing to try to get my hands around it. But uh, I, I have not begun the process. I understand. I understand. The board, and just from my standpoint, I think Janine's pointed out my concern. You know, we've been given raises without a backstop mm -hmm. of who's topped out, whatever. That's that's what we're trying to do. I guess from a a budget standpoint, I, I understand what David's saying that this is a lot to digest. It was a lot to put together. Um, we just kind of felt like it had to be part of the budgeting process, otherwise you're going to lose a year or some months. So um, we're here at the end of June. I don't know how much time everybody has. And I think that was when I brought it up in the budget meeting is that's why I wanted to let's get it to the board so we don't lose another 30 days. But, you know, not being able to hire people affects everything. What, what we can do for y'all, what we can do for the students. Um, <laughs> But I just was more concerned as the CFO about continuing to give raises with no information to back it up. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the other other thing I always struggle with, no matter what business I'm looking at, is we hadn't created any income, right? Mm -hmm. We didn't create any new revenue source or income. So uh, you know that, that creates a bit of a challenge. Uh, when you're not creating a cash flow source to do things. That doesn't mean we don't need to do things. I need to get my hands around it. And I don't have around it. So I always have to be honest about that and try to dig in a little bit. Recognizing these things we need to make a challenge. Certainly, we're going to be able to answer any questions anybody has as best we can. And Dr. King, I certainly would be, I can appreciate it. Uh, and I had a conversation with David about the challenge that he's facing in a position that's you know, critical to our needs. That if, if, if we're at this point where there are uh, exigent circumstances, then we certainly can take some actions to, to loosen the band, if, 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 if you will, when we're dealing with a, with a, a late stage problem. And try to help fix that. I, I don't mean to be insensitive to the fact that, that even though a lot of us are sitting here saying this is this is pretty new, it, you know, to, so we didn't know you've been spending six months working on it. 
Uh, I wish I'd been had some of that six months to be learning about it. You know, you get it, but you didn't have it done then. So you know, it's kind of how it goes. But I, I, I think we can be uh, saying, uh, tell us, we, we need to make some immediate adjustments. It's not going to fix the institution, but as everyone, I think, has contributed to the enunciation of the, of the problem, it didn't happen overnight. Either. It took years and years to develop. And I just don't think that if we can just declare this is it, let's do it. I hope so. Janine, you're a genius. And you probably are. But but I, I can't get there that soon. And, and I think we have a lot of other things to talk about too. This particular plan is a billion dollar price tag. And then it goes on more or less forever after that, or or up. And we're sitting here funding our next year budget plan with $2 million coming free of charge, if you will, courtesy of the appraisal district. Not revenue we produced. We have gone backward in nine of the last 10 years. We'll talk about those things more in our budget. But we have to get it in perspective that we're solving problems with federal government money to the end of with 3.80 year if you average the, the eight or so that's left, plus the two that we're reaching out dragging in from taxes. And the government, the HERF money, is, mm -hmm. is going to disappear in the next budget cycle. But yet we're going to, we're ready to go ahead and stack it in. I just think we have to really have to look at all of that and and, and take the time to, and there may be some that can spend every single day. I cannot. I won't. But I will do the best that I can. But my $10 a month only goes so far. The rest of it's just love for the institution. You, you know, still have a job to do. So that's all I'm looking for. I'm not trying to rain on, on anything. I, I'm just saying I don't think we can get there as quickly as, as what you put in front of us would, would suggest. Do you have a solution? Pardon? Do you have a solution, a, a way to start uh, moving forward? I, I think a way to start moving forward would be to say to these guys that are in, in, in stress with regard to uh, positions to tell us about it, tell you about it. You pull us together and say, I need to do these things right now. Again, that's stop gap, that's a band aid. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not at all advocating that that's just how we go on forever. And then let's take what we have here and start working with it and getting our, our understanding in place, not just the budget committee, but, but the whole board. Everybody's going to vote on that thing. Okay. Anybody else have any I'm other? I'm not much important. I think it might have been Dr. Eason. And, and I thought it was a good observation. What can we do? And Absolutely. what do we tell people that, that we're shooting for? Uh, I, I, I think it is correct to say that, that if, if you don't if you don't set a bar somewhere uh, or an expectation, then it just lingers. It just doesn't mm -hmm. move. Maybe that's some of what happened internally uh, when you guys never set a bar to, to, to get something in front of us to talk about. Um, it's not all on the board. We get it from, from you all. But let's say then that um, if, if we absorb and at the time we're next together, that we could say, well, a reasonable timeline is 90 days, something like that. This budget that we go into is like every other budget. It's not cast in time. It can be amended. This, this can be inserted at any time and an adjustment made. If it's a million bucks, it's a million bucks. If it's something different than that, then, then so be it. Again, not trying to stall, most assuredly. That's not the point. I just want to do it in a way that I, I can feel comfortable that I understood what I was looking at and I agreed with it. Would you recommend that we have a meeting among the full board? In the near future, regarding we just need a chance to look at what you did. Right, I got that. But would you recommend before now, 
July board meeting that we have an opportunity to discuss it or what? I, I, I don't know about that. I think that depends. Why don't you let everybody digest it and then, then start telling me what, what they think? Call you, send you an email and say, Gary, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm ready, to, ready to sit down and talk some more about this. Well, why don't we just ask right now if we're sitting here? We can have another meeting. Well, they haven't digested this. Well, it's going to be the next meeting would be the time that we would talk about. Hopefully, that would be a time frame that they could ingest it and could go over it. Would that be two weeks? Pleasure. Steve, you were at the board budget meeting. What are your thoughts? Well, um, I have two or three thoughts. I see uh, what's being proposed is uh, very concerning in terms of salary. I also see that we need some way to analyze salaries and get it more uniform so you can be competitive. Uh, I also go back to something that Dr. Charlie said earlier in the meeting, and that was when he was looking at a budget without her funds involved to really get a handle of where we're going next year. We can't predict, we can't predict. I mean, what you're telling us is a very favorable, and I mean, it's a, it's a conservative from your standpoint, but it certainly points to higher revenues, and, uh, you know, and due to growth. But uh, I think we, as Dr. Neeson said, we have issues here that we've identified. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, you know, I, I I don't think anyone here would philosophically disagree with having the bands that you talked about in the report that I, as I understand it, to, to Clarify what staff does and what how they're going to be paid and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, but we need to be one of our best assets, valuable, valuable asset is the employees here. And mm -hmm. I, I think we need to look at that. But we're looking at, as uh, Trustee Monk said, a million dollars coming in on the budget. And we've got still some unknowns out there because of the pandemic. I think it would be irresponsible not to consider what we're doing if, 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 if we get at this level or another level somewhat. And there doesn't mean we don't work toward it is. And it doesn't mean that we don't adjust the budget as we get down the road. I, for one, have looked into this. I talked to Janine today. I talked to David Hopkins quite a bit. I talked to Jerry. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, it, it's been a learning process for me. I recognize there's some problems here. But I don't have a solution. Mm -hmm. And I think anybody here, which I, I, we all might say we have one, and it looks good on paper, but I do think a little more time will it take uh, 60 days, 90 days, six months? I don't know. But I mean, I think we all need to be thinking about it. That was the purpose of tonight. And I really feel that uh, we need to address these issues. I think it would take some time to just look at what if this happens, what if that happens, but come back in a reasonable period of time and make an effort to get down the road. There may be a few things that need to be done urgently. I would like to know what those are, but to think that a problem that we didn't finish in 2011 that's lingered on for 10 years, and we're fixing to fix it in 60 days and do it well, is under. I mean, you know, it, it's taken. No, it had, it's been going on for ten years. If, if we doing something quickly is not as important as doing something correctly, and it needs to be dealt with. I'm, I'm for dealing with it, but I can't put a timeline and just say, "Hey, you know, we're gonna have this done in sixty days, right or wrong." And, and I, I can't get there. I mean, Will we come up with something that quick? It's possible, but I like it. Okay. Could I, could I really help? If, if in fact the board is not ready, this is just you see if I'm talking, but we've got two million dollars in contingency now. Let's if, if we weren't ready on September first, we could move the money, whatever that is, whatever you all decide, into contingency. And if it turns out to be October or November or whenever that the board is ready to take action. As David said, we can adjust the budget at that time. But I will say, looking back at 2011 and 
what Janine and I talked about is we don't want to start adjusting positions piecemeal. That's what got us in trouble last time. And the other thing that happens, we talked about, well, phasing this in. Well, the problem is then when you hire the new guy, he's going to slide down the scale ahead of your old your, your old heads that are here. And so it, it's one of those things where the piecemeal got us in trouble once before. We don't want to do that again. Not disagreeing, just trying to get something before you. If you have a problem that hasn't been solved in seven months. Yeah, I mean, our issue may be more starting salary. We can try to deal with that. We The reason for this is that if the board wanted to do something, all these folks could post the scale, the new scale. Right now, all we can post is the old scale. And that's that's where the rub comes in. But it gets kind of gets back to the band-aid of, well, if Philip does this one and I do that one, uh, I, just, I don't want to create more problems. You know. Well, and that's bad for morale. I'm sorry. Can't, may I? Sure. Um, so that's, that's also bad for morale. As you mentioned, we've got people that are doing the exact same job on different campuses, making considerably more money. That creates a morale issue that, that we have to try to deal with. And so we, we, we don't need that. We don't need to be able to say, well, I can't hire this particular position, so let me add some, some money into this stuff, you know, into the hiring salary. Because that's just going to continue what we've been doing. And that's, that's going to continue the problem we've got now. I think we understand. We, we, I, mean, I, I think I can say we, and I certainly can say I, will solve this problem correctly. It needs to be solved. And you know, maybe there's something we can do quick, but I don't think we can fix it. One thing like it needs to be done in the next six months. Hey, I think it's a lot. You can do something. I mean, don't get me wrong. You, you can do something. I just don't know if it's correct. And, and I want to make sure we get our hands. I've, been, I've just got to look at it. I don't know what I've got here. So, yeah. personally, so I just have to get some hands around it. You know, maybe I'm going to read it. It's simpler than I think. But, you know. well, that's, I think before we yeah, everybody look at it. Well, ask the question. Yeah, why don't we do this then? You, you said something about, well, why don't I give you an opportunity? We give you an opportunity to look at it over the next couple of weeks, and then you can let me know. Contact me and let me know what what you believe would be the next best step. Would it be to meet together again before? I mean, there, you're right. It doesn't have to be done in a hurry. We, we, we really never, I mean, it would be nice, but it doesn't have to be done in a hurry. But we just need to get it done. We just need to move forward with it. And I want to tell you, so let's just put this out here and it's going to be unpopular. I want you to go ahead. We have a complication, I believe, because we operate in different job markets. If you compete in the nursing market mm -hmm. in the Metroplex, mm -hmm. Terra, Dallas, mm -hmm. versus in East Texas, mm -hmm. it's different. It is. Okay. And we're, we're going to have some struggles. We've got to figure out how we want to deal with that. <laughs> because I, I, if you're hiring out of that Metroplex market, it'll it can blow your deal up here. And vice versa, if you you can hire people sometimes here and, that you can't touch in Dallas. And, and that's just reality. That may not be popular, but it's the world I live in every day mm -hmm. where I work. And we need to think a little bit how we want to manage that because it's real. And and I know that I've sat around the table here and listened to a lot of discussions over the years about wanting to do everything the same for everybody. And that's great, but it's not reality. It's not the job market we're going to hire and compete in. Uh, it's just yeah. reality. So, and we are losing, we're losing valuable employees to. Dallas College, Collins, Tarrant County. Yeah, and, and, you know, we're losing employees there to those institutions. And, and you know, that's a bit of a challenge to use those three colleges as a comparison for us. Because you, you especially lose them. That the ones that, that spend their whole life down here. And I don't know if that can sound derogatory in any way. Please, <laughs> please. Yeah, I like it. I like it here. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that. It's a choice. That's right. 
plant that you probably work a little cheaper because there are different different competitive issues we have to be realistic about well and I and to your point Dr. Charlie um I just wanted to bring this up too I had I said on an average that the college staff is 23.3 percent below the market minimum and according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics and the U.S. Census Bureau, the average income for Henderson County, this is just Henderson County, I didn't go outside of any other service area, increased over the last 10 years by 24%. So I don't think that the figure, the 23.3% below market, is an unreasonable figure to come up with. Does that make sense? Yeah. So... I just, you know, even though we've used some of those outside, you know, bigger institutions, maybe those more metroplex type institutions, I still feel like we're well within what has been happening for the years. And, and I think it totally brings us along where we should be. But do we have the data in here of other colleges? Only ones that we matched with the jobs. So, okay. does that make sense? Obviously. And I didn't, yeah, I didn't include every single job that we looked at and, and the comparisons that we made. I didn't include that in that packet. I only provided an example to explain how we did it. If that's what, if that's something that you would like to have, I can more than happy to provide it. I just, I just got to get my head around it. I don't know. Oh, totally. It's a lot to digest, <laughs> for sure. Please let us know if we can help. Absolutely. I mean, phone calls, emails, if you guys have any questions whatsoever, so I, I'm available. Is, what is your greatest immediate need? Well, the greatest immediate need. Is, if we don't fix one thing right next week, what would it be? I don't know how you separate it. I don't know. There's, there's, yeah, yeah there's, there's you no, gotta unfortunately. Scale, you got to put the scales in place, but you got to put the employees on the scale. Right. Otherwise, you create a morale problem. You don't want it. Okay. You should be in politics. I was. He didn't, he didn't like it either. Too much longer. Okay. Well, again, I, I am available anytime. Listen, I'm at your guys' disposal if you have questions. I appreciate you guys taking the time. I appreciate the information. I recognize there's a problem, and I will solve it. It will be part of the solution. Can I make a comment that we discussed this at the budget meeting? And, and I've also had enough to talk with Janine about this. That they, there were some um, <clears throat> scales that were balanced. Like, for example, if you were in the Metroplex, they tried to discount and allow the 5% or some percentage. I'm not sure how you came up with that percent, but they did discount and add to, given the standard of living in, in, in the bigger cities and the smaller towns. I, but you know, and I know you went with medium, not mean, but also did you take frequency? And, and I think you did say if you saw a salary that looked out of whack, to me that may be frequency. And wait, I figure a lot of times I'm not that good every day, but frequency is, you know. It, 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 much it repeats and the more frequent it is or the less you frequent it is you throw it out all together and right. i guess that's what you do. yes and we did do that so when we were looking at um other institutions and, and we would find a job and we're like oh wow well, that, that actually matches but then we go look at the salary and if it was like way out of range of what we were seeing as the pattern for that particular job we just stopped and we went back and we re reevaluated it to make sure that this is really what it is and make sure it is a good match for what we were doing did, did, did we find some of those? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I found ones that I thought were going to be a perfect match and ended up not even being close. Um, and so we were very, very diligent about the jobs that we picked um, or that we matched. And we made sure that every single, all the duties were matched appropriately to that. You know, and, and every institution words their job descriptions differently. And so that was a very tedious process. Um, we weren't able to use any software to do that with. It was literally by eye. We took each job duty list and we put ours on there. And then we'd take that institution and we would literally go bullet by bullet and, and make a comparison. Um, and so it was, um, it was a very tedious and intense process. But we, 
um, were very diligent and made sure that the jobs that we did match made sense um, and that we weren't putting you know an $85,000 salary job with a $30,000 uh, average pay position it just didn't make sense so when we do compares to Austin College we took a a, a negative wife for quality of life or cost of living. Cost living, yes. Yes, and then we did any years of experience adjustment and any educational degree differences. We also adjusted it for that as well. And I would say about 99.9% .9 of the time, it worked out exactly the way it should have. Um, it was it was very, it was surprising on how well that, that whole process really did work. We will work through this process. I don't know if it'll be perfect. There won't be perfect for you, but it'll be better. Yes. I don't, I just don't know what it's going to take. But we will work through it. We got, the, we got good people to do it with. I appreciate your help. Thank you. Thank, thank you all for bringing this to our attention. Absolutely. Well, let, let, let me say the final thing. Uh, in all practicality, everybody sitting in this circle doesn't understand this at all. No, not at all. We don't even know what questions to ask. And so what has happened, the professionals have taken it on themselves to do this work. And when we pull it out of their hands, what we're really saying is we don't trust you guys. And I'm saying I trust you guys. And I'm saying I may not understand everything in the salary study, and I could read this from now to end of the year and still may not understand it, but I trust you guys. And I think we as a board even need to look at it at this level that we're never going to understand this. We are not in human resources. We don't do salary studies. That we've we've put in the hands of vice presidents and human resources or human resource directors to do a job. And they've done a good job. And for us now to postpone this, I think what we relate to not them, but everybody that's sitting in this room and everybody that's watching on Zoom is that we don't trust you. I, I would disagree with that. That's right, I understand. Because our responsibility here is not only to them, it's the people that fund the school. And we, whatever we agree to has to be funded this year, next year, the year after. It'll never go back. It'll only go up. I mean, that's just what happens. Benefits, everything. And so our responsibility is to take their information here. Uh, but we have responsibility. People that elect us are taxpayers. And uh, Students pay the bills, the taxpayers pay the bills, and the state of Texas pays the bills for the taxpayers. And we've got a responsibility there as well. It's not who we trust them or not. It's a matter of what our fiduciary responsibility is as well. And uh, so I have no distrust of them at all. Uh, I trust them a lot. I think they, I think they know what they're doing. But I, my responsibility is to others as well. So I'll just leave it that way. But I appreciate your comment. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right, why don't we just sit on this uh, or sleep on this or whatever you want to call it for for uh, next few weeks and uh, provide feedback back and, to me. And provide feedback back to the staff here. And uh, then if it, if somebody comes up with a magic thought that we how we can get together and do it, study it, so we'll we'll do it. How about that? If not, we'll just keep. We're, we're started. We started the process. We got to start. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, Charlie, it's time to go home. I'm going to make a motion to adjourn. A motion made to Texas to adjourn. All, right. all in favor say aye. Uh, all opposed like sign. Thank you all.
1022.